I was just watching this old Canadian game show called Uh Oh that I used to watch as a kid, and it was just like they had a lot of those speed rounds on them. But the questions were half the questions were like personal. You know, it'd be like, "What's your favorite food?" and the kids like, oh, "I don't know," and they're like, "No, what about pizza? Do you like?" and they're like, oh, uh, "Pizza? What?" <laughs> They're like memorizing trivia, and then they have to think about themselves. For every wrong question, you have to eat oh a, a bar of laxative. Yeah. This is uh oh. Well, it was like one of those Nickelodeon <laughs> ripoffs where they get like slimed, you know? Oh, I they love, get, like, dude. In... I love that. There's, I mean, slime is a big influence on me. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, it's say, a... yeah. And there was this villain called the Punisher on the show, who was this guy in like a dominatrix like gimp suit outfit. And they'd like release him from chains at the beginning and they'd be like, control, Punisher, control. And he'd like have like a bucket ready to go. And he'd always try and ask like, or he'd try and answer like if they get the questions wrong. He'd have some joke statement that had to do with the question, but it didn't really. They'd be like, if it was a math thing, he'd just be like, two plus two equals slime time. And you're like, what? Uh, slime math? I didn't study my slime math. <laughs> yeah, but I loved that show. That was like, Universal. I think everybody who grew up in Canada in the '90s was like obsessed. Uh -oh. With <laughs> that's great. Honestly, yeah, that's kind of that's the that's kind of like the funny part about like North America is that, like there were so many crazy shows like this. I feel like we didn't have anything like kind of nuts like this. Why in so France. slime based? Why so slime yeah, based? Was slime was who huge started the there. slime yeah. the slime rush? I think I know about okay. the gold rush. Who started the the slime rush? Of I would. The 90s, you know? the I would definitely mines. say Nickelodeon started the slime, but I think the slime the kids love the slime because it's it's kind of gross. Yeah, it's like kids like like food fights. And yeah, stuff, right? and it but it it's it's kind of gross, but it's not as gross as real like food or like matter. You know, I don't know <laughs> because it's so vague. It's like the chicken and the egg thing, though. Like, did kids like the slime? And then they were like, "Let's put this in the show," or were they, or or do kids <laughs> like the slime because they just one guy was like, "I have an idea." just a lot of slime we put it on kids we yeah, put this green I stuff it... i invented it like it's like big like big slime was their major benefactor i definitely like, think you know like yeah. pumping out slime the corporations <laughs> yeah. you know how like play-doh is like like everybody loves play-doh even the parents i mean it's messy but they're like play-doh is still good for your brain but then somebody yeah, you must can eat it and it's yeah. okay yeah. fosters good they thinking they must have seen like someone must have seen play-doh and probably thought, what if this isn't goopy enough? Yeah, what if it made it more gross? <laughs> this would be better if it yeah. made a mess. It would mess be better more, if yeah. you like could sculpt something, but it didn't hold together. It just got it's everywhere. Too easy to clean up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's my belief. That's my origin story. Personally. Slime is slime is very zen. You know, like you tr you can try to make a little sculpture, but it's not gonna hold. It's gonna get. You can try to do something. But you're not gonna do yeah, it. Yeah, and then there was <laughs> Ivan Ivan Ooze from Power Rangers. This is just like it was slime oh, yeah. coming from all angles. He was purple slime. Then there's green slime. <laughs> was he part of the the Japanese footage or was he part of the American stuff that they had? I added? think American. <laughs> that makes and sense. And then and then there was just like the I don't know, the separate sort of phenomenon of you get a little slime bucket and then stick your finger into the slime and it farts. And then everyone yeah, was like, yeah. slime <laughs> rules. <laughs> You like you dump it on people. You like poke it, and it makes a fart noise. It's like the best kid thing. Oh wait, what about what about Ghostbusters? Because that was a big like mm. they're like, oh, he slimed me. You know, there's Slimer in the movie. And, yeah. and, and then, then there like, was like the the cartoon too. that might have been part of it too. Flubber. Yeah, Flubber. it's it's from all directions, and not only that, it has <laughs> persisted. And now people watch like ASMR slime videos and like make slime with their yeah. kids, and it hasn't the propaganda it hasn't worked. gone away it's like multi-generational it's a universal language you don't need to speak english to love it slime is <laughs> slime is multi-tiered the alien alien Hitting all four quadrants all our target demos the, a, like for slime. like many years from now archaeologists are going to dig up a patch of slime or whatever and they're going to be like this is something that we we've traced slime from from this generation all the way through the ancestors and then the ancient pyramids had a, a slime jar and like and they were loving to play with slime too it's just it's like the universal human experience yeah gotta love slime that's true man yeah that, so that was the slime episode thanks everybody for coming uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right i hope we can come on the show again sometime bye <laughs>
welcome to Creative Block. We're your hosts, V. And Sean, we interview people in the creative industries about their life, work, and hobbies while we doodle jam. We asked people on our social medias if they had specific topics they wanted us to discuss, as well as some drawing prompts. Today we have with us Aaron Long. Hey, thanks for having Hello. me on the show. Happy Hi. to be here. Of course. I'm so excited to have you on the show because you are one of a few people who can do both industry work, animation industry work, working with those studios, and have your own animation YouTube channel. You travel freely between the realities. Yeah, like, between the realms. Portal shifter. <laughs> and I guess the first question that comes to mind for me is, which one did you start first? Oh, it would have definitely just been the YouTube stuff because I was doing that even as a teenager. You know, there was like a very gradual transition from like scribbling on paper and then doing flip books and then trying different computer things like, you know, any program I could use to make animation. And then I ended up settling on Flash eventually and uh, doing some shorts that then led to industry work. So and then I just didn't stop doing the shorts because I was doing them for fun to begin with, you know. Mm -hmm, and I still mm -hmm. just kind of do them for fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. So you said that you started like uh, playing around with all these different softwares and making music and all that. But were you, did you start right off the bat with Sublo and Tangy Mustard? Or did you have little other animated shorts prior to that? Oh, I had other ones. Uh, I did, um, there's a little series called Space Goose that was like three episodes. I did a bunch of little stop motion things. I did, I'm drawing him now, this character Fester Fish that I did a few shorts with and during college. I haven't drawn him for a while. But he was this weird little like fish man in his underwear. And he, those shorts were really like Looney Tunes inspired. Uh, or mm -hmm. Looney Tunes and like Popeye, Betty Boop. I just loved a lot of old cartoons like that. So um, those were sort of my homage to those. And then it led to uh, getting some jobs doing similar kind of rubber hosey retro kind of things mm -hmm. and then that led to industry work eventually oh that's so cool do you feel like the first jobs that you got were freelance or was it did, were you in-house how how can you talk a little bit more in detail oh, sure, yeah so other than like oh my my dad's friend needs a poster for something or like a, a music video mm -hmm. or whatever class yeah there's a lot of that um <laughs> like, hey, we all share that client yeah hey, we i'll give you like ten dollars if you do a poster or whatever and you're like wow <laughs> money for art sounds good to me i did like a whole I think minute of animation for a, like a friend of his music video and then i don't even know if i got paid or if it was just like hey he's my dad's friend i guess i owe him for something <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first major thing I think was uh, I, I don't know if either of you know Scout Raskin. She's worked at like a yeah. um, bunch of studios. She was I, I met her when she was at Shadow Machine, and we were both there. But uh, but she's also worked at like she was on Rick and Morty for a while, in Central Park, and uh, all kinds of stuff. She does goat yoga, right? Yeah, yeah, she has goat yoga. Her side hustle. <laughs> she is goats. Yeah, yeah. But she <laughs> um, she was making shorts on the side too that she was sort of financing through working in production. She doesn't draw, but she was, like, writing and had an idea for, like, a 1930s-y short. So she saw this character that I've just doodled that was kind of... He's not really that rubber hosey looking. Like, I, I couldn't really commit to that. <laughs> he's more, like, stretch and squashy. But she liked those. And so when I was in my last year of college, I was animating a short for her. I was doing maybe, like, 10 seconds a week or something. Uh, and she was really just kind of like, I like what you do with that. Can you do that for me? And, Here's the script. Can you design the characters and stuff? So that was like ended up being like a part time job during the end of college that I was just doing remotely from from here in Toronto. And then around the time I graduated, she was like, hey, do you want to move to L.A. for six months or something, seven months to work on a season of a show? And that I'm working as like a producer on. I don't know if she was a producer at the beginning, but by the end of the mm -hmm. show, she was a producer uh, and she was like. You know, you can come work as an animator or you can do sketches remotely for it because it was a sketch comedy show. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called Trip Tank. And they were really like mm -hmm. taking a lot of chances on weird, young, inexperienced artists such as myself because they didn't have because at the time Shadow Machine had only done stop mo. So they didn't have like a built in 2D talent roster. You know what I mean? Like they didn't mm -hmm. know a lot of 2D artists. So they just grabbed a bunch who were like leaving Titmouse at the time and 
a bunch of people who were pretty new and and so that was really lucky that like mm-hmm. there wasn't a studio that anybody would have set their sights on and gone like that's where i'm aiming to work on trip tank a shadow machine in 2013 <laughs> it was just sort of like <laughs> hey somebody's gonna pay me that sounds great yeah and i didn't even expect to move to la i was planning to stay in toronto but uh but i got a job in la before i did in toronto so i i was like i guess i'll move down and try it <laughs> nice yeah, i worked on some trip tank stuff oh yeah wait which ones did you do Long, long time, long time ago, there was one that I don't put on my reel because it was pretty bad. <laughs> There's a lot of that on that show, yeah. About, it was a, about a Mexican donkey show, if you know what that I is. I think I vaguely remember that one, yeah. But instead of someone having intercourse with a donkey, it was about a donkey magician who's who Yeah, that's right. Disappointed I do remember that. He keeps doing he, he keeps doing tricks, and everyone's disappointed because yeah, they're like, "Where's the sex, sex yeah, with, yeah. The person, with the with the person?" That sounds yeah. like trip tank. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's <laughs> that. That's my experience with with, like with with trip tank. A lot of trip tank, <laughs> and even at the time, I kind of had this criticism. It felt not not necessarily that sketch. I don't really remember it too well, but it was based on like stuff that didn't even feel relevant. There was so many sketches that were like oh. that started with like the premise of like a 1950s Leave It to Beaver sitcom, you know? And I was like, mm. like nobody watching this even knows what this show is. Like, why are you making fun of Leave It to Beaver on this? It's like yeah, what it, if Leave It, it to Beaver like was it, fucked it, up, you know? Or it, 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 it seemed like they it seemed like they had some like live action sketch people that wanted to make cartoons that were like a little edgy and yeah, yeah. I always I, I was the whole time I was just wish I was like man just I, I wish I could have pitched something instead of this <laughs> like like I I, I wish yeah I exactly. could have just like pitched an idea I think that's something that's really true in animation is that they kind of tend to favor writers that come from sketch or comedy like writers writers that you know that are coming with a writing portfolio rather than cartoonist for yeah. some reason and i don't really know why i just it's just an observation yeah that i was sure. just making i guess they just assume they have some basic ability to write and they don't know if a cartoonist would you know they're mm. like well you can draw but can you tell yeah. a story but i feel like most can as well as like a sketch comedy writer would you know have, have, <laughs> have, have you have you have you had a lot of cartoon people or producers or whatever sort of doubt your writing capabilities just because you were you know just because you're an animator. I haven't really tried too hard to convince them of my writing abilities. Okay, okay, I've, okay. Go, I've okay, pitched good, a little good. bit, but that wasn't specifically an issue so much as they didn't want the show I was selling, you know? Sure. Which was the mm. sub We could probably talk more about that later. Listen, but, uh... the, the writing is really good, but we hate the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of, you know? <laughs> I, I was interested, like, like we, we did go right to you animating. Mm-hmm. You did, did you, did you ever work like a sign spinning mascot position out front of a? No, like, I've never is that worked as a mascot. Something that you're drawing from from your own life? <laughs> no, I wish I could say yes, but I just I was trying to think of jobs that were sort of like visually interesting, I guess, and not, mm-hmm. not you know, that would have some kind of like weird like gimmicky hook. So, because I basically just wanted to do a show about dumb stuff that me and my friends were doing in my like mid twenties at the time, and I was like, "Oh, that's like they can just kind of go around and do all this dumb stuff, but they're wearing these weird suits, so it feels like there's like a premise to it, (laughs) even though it's not, you know." Oh, that's bad. That's what I was thinking when I was watching it. I was like, "I wonder if Aaron just thought I want to draw cartoon characters, but I want them to be in the real world. So how can I make (laughs) that work?" (laughs) Exactly. That's basically it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it, it's it, it's like uh like getting to do characters and getting the love of like the furry community but you're like no they're mascots they're sports teams oh no <laughs> furries like the show because they're not like animal you know they don't look like yeah, furries yeah, yeah. they just in real life they would be a little more of like oh it's kind of like a fursuit but the way i draw them they don't I care do love so, that. so I'm a... <laughs> there's one episode that you did that is so clever and i was like damn he like got as good is when in the convention when like tangy mustard slips out of the costume oh, but yeah. you never see him out of the costume i was like galaxy brain <laughs> <laughs> i was like are we gonna see him out of the costume and we did not no. you just you see that he left the costume but you don't see him outside of it yeah yeah that was really good <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah but so i was on i was on trip tank animating and storyboarding a little bit i got to direct one segment on it but that show was really cool i think i've talked about this on twitter too how it's just like it was so chaotic that they would be like hey this week you're animating something next week you're going to be doing backgrounds on this other short in a different style for a different director and then 
after that, you're going to do some storyboarding. So it's a good mix of everything. Mm. So, so that was the style of your first job, too. I because yeah. I was over at Fox ADHD. Oh, they were doing that. And yeah, I was yeah. making, and I was making shorts every week. But we would trade off who was boarding, who was designing, who was animating, right? And we would all take turns. And so my first job experience also felt like that, just like a, a chaotic <laughs> yeah. gauntlet of like, <laughs> like trying to adapt to different styles. It's kind and of like, fun yeah. though, right? I mean, I feel yeah. like I don't know how you feel about. It. Fox ADHD, but it, on Trip Tank, I definitely felt like we had more fun making the show than it would be to watch the show, you know? Like, <laughs> partly because the scripts were always kind of like, oh, this is kind of funny, but kind of dumb, but bro -y, you know? So, mm -hmm. like, we were having a great time making it, but I, I don't know if it's really translates to the, the show itself. <laughs> It's also kind of hard with these sketch shows. I feel like every time there's an animated sketch show, it, 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 it does... Mm, how should I phrase this? It, it's just a harder sell for the audience because because yeah. there's been a couple like I think the most popular one was probably the Mad uh, on oh, yeah, uh, yeah. sketch show on Cartoon Network. I think that one was really popular, but there there has been a couple other ones like well I guess Robot Chicken was was a popular one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel like mm. I mean Mad didn't really have this. Robot Chicken definitely does. Where even though it's all individual sketches <laughs> and there's no cohesiveness to it. It has like a consistent style, so you're kind of like, oh, that's the right. thing I like, the, the show where they look like that. Because I think mm -hmm. a lot of these other yeah. ones, you know, the voice actors are always different a lot of the time. There's not like a standard cast, at least on Trip Tank. Mm -hmm. And the oh, art was, was always on changing. Disney oh, that which one? was called, it ends with Kapow. Is... is it Kablam? No, not Kablam. It's well, that, uh, Crush. Yeah, okay. uh -huh. It's something something Kapow. Yeah, and something it kind of like rhymes, a... right? Yeah, like how now, oh, Kapow or something. <laughs> yes, right now, Kapow. Right, right now, now Kapow. Kapow. Yeah, yeah. I've been yeah, and and the and it's really like a sketch show where like all of the different characters keep coming back, but they're it's it's like the animated characters are a um an actor, so that they're not always playing exactly the same role, but you see the same cast coming back, and I do feel like even though that was like a really crazy show for Disney. I do feel like like a minority of people got attached to the characters because it's the same characters coming back. Right, yeah, Rather yeah. than like a full on different style every episode, which that's a little harder for people to, yeah, yeah like you said, realize it's the same show. Like mm -hmm. as an artist, you're like, oh, cool. I want to try different styles. But as a mm -hmm. viewer, I guess there's not that much to hold on to when everything is, is always changing. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. But yeah. And then after that, I, I kind of started on Bojack because it just sort of started right after that like overlapping a little bit and you I were think. on that for a long and that you were on that for a long time weren't you i was on bojack from start to finish yeah they were doing the pilot when i got there as trip wow. tank was kind of also in production and then i rolled directly onto season one and then in season three i was kind of assistant directing and then uh, i was mostly storyboarding up to that point and doing animation retakes but i also was like designing some background characters because it was just so <laughs> such a desperate mess mm. in the beginning <laughs> Because it was yeah, I heard that like <laughs> yeah. Shadow Machine is kind of a is it was a little bit, like crazy at the beginning, right? Oh, it was oh. nonsensical, yeah. Because they didn't know how to make like a. I don't mean this as a knock at them, but I just mean like the fact is that they hadn't made like a a two D show with like the same characters. Like they'd done Trip Tank, but mm -hmm. that was all sketches. And so this one was like, wait, how do we? How do we make it, it all accidentally work looking the same? like different styles <laughs> in between episodes? Well, it was just a lot of like, oh, we do, we haven't done this before. We don't know how to do this. So you know, first seasons are always a mess because you're like, mm -hmm. what is the show we're trying to make, and how do we make that, and how do we get everybody on the same page with that? So it was tough, but that again also kind of gave me the opportunity to do like r random little character designs, and as well as like animation and boards and come up with gags as like solutions to things because they'd be like yeah. oh we can't do this joke that's in the script for some reason we have to come up with something else and so then you know oh that's so their shortcomings <laughs> ended up being like like a, like a secret little hidden door for you to like insert always yeah yeah like, <laughs> things that you wouldn't normally get to uh, you know put into a show yeah it, do, do you have any examples of that um, um that you can think of season like one. stuff that you were able to sneak in I'm trying to think in season one i remember there was i think in season one i what was it andrew garfield this wasn't just my idea but i was the one who did it and kind of co-conspirator with it where uh i think i think it's probably fine to tell this now but he was supposed to 
my understanding was he was supposed to do a voice on the show and then he didn't he like backed out or something or they couldn't get him and they were like okay well fine if he's not gonna do a voice for us then we're gonna make him look really stupid so they had him doing all these pretentious Egon Scheel, I forgot how to say his name, Skyle or something, this German artist, mm-hmm. where he's, yeah, yeah. all his poses mm-hmm. are always very, like, his arms are wrapped around oh himself and yes. stuff. Super kind of contrived, but it looks so cool. I love that artist. But anyway, they were like, just make him constantly be doing Egon Scheel poses uh, as he's talking. That's, that's, that's really funny. And so, that is... <laughs> So that is so and, specific and spiteful <laughs> like, yeah. like a little bit like catty yeah yeah I, I like that like it's, yeah. and then it's later so, on of yeah. course they were able to get like any celebrity i think they wanted basically that is so interesting but i it's not like that was my idea i was just kind of like the one who who did that and it was like a last minute addition sort of you know well in season one i can't remember i didn't come up with a lot of stuff in season one but more when i was directing you know they'd be like you were allowed to sort of pitch solutions to things mm. this is where it gets hard to draw and think at the same time <laughs> oh it's, it's all right it's all right you can take a break from one and <laughs> from squiggling focus on hyper in. focus on the other mm-hmm. but yeah i mean it was just like a it was a show I, I mean it's not like we were totally rewriting scripts or anything but we were like i felt like they respected artists as having something to contribute beyond just like a pair of hands you know i wish i could think of more specific things that we pitched to them but uh but in general, you know, you felt like if I have an idea for how to make this better, they're willing to listen and maybe do it. They wouldn't just shoot it down because it's coming from an artist. Which I think is really cool because I feel like there's, there are, like, depending on the production, sometimes it's it's very much like only the writers get to fix all those story problems. Yeah. And, and, the, and the artists are, like, a very separated. So that's actually really cool to hear that they were open to this kind of collaboration and sometimes they're um, like oh we can't think of anything there must be nothing there must be no way to fix this and you're like i have something but you, you won't listen you know <laughs> yeah and they're like that'll never work mm-hmm. it'll just be a drawing yeah <laughs> a drawing can't fix but no, this problem Bojack and tuka they were they were both uh Raphael and lisa were really good about it i mean lisa was an artist so she was certainly mm-hmm. not against the idea of artists having ideas <laughs> Yeah, that's also cool because uh, she was brought onto the project really early on. And um, well, for anybody listening to this episode, if you're really excited about like how Bo- Bojack kind of came about, the Art of Bojack, the book, the Art of Bojack yeah, really goes over all these details. It's really good. The art before the horse, I think the, the title yes. is. Mm-hmm. There's even the the pitch bible in there which Mm. is really cool to see how like he went about it and there's like a lot of interviews too where they kind of talk about all of the different steps and stuff because it before going to shadow machine they they went through like production companies to kind of pitch to like netflix and stuff and yeah there was a lot of stuff i didn't even know in there even having worked on it the whole time i was like wait yeah that was your original (laughs) plan whoa (laughs) um (laughs) I remember, I think they, they did that book either during season four or season five, and like coming around to everybody and being like, hey, go through all your old folders. Do you have any cool, weird sketches or whatever? It's all just like lewd sketches that like... Well, we submitted a bunch like, that didn't we go can't, We can't include any of this in the book. <laughs> uh, you all just drew him with his pants <laughs> off. What is everyone doing? Well, that was for the show. I remember that was season one, episode true, seven. True, there's, true. A, there's a Bojack nude scene, <laughs> and they had to do a drawing of, of Bojack with his dick. Um, I don't think it ever made it to air, but it existed on the server. It's in the vault. Give us, give (laughs) us the nudes. Give us the nudes. Wait, that's funny because Bojack was on Netflix and Netflix has uncensored nudity in some of their shows now. But I guess back in the, because Bojack was the first animated show on Netflix that was like ordered by, like commissioned by Netflix. Maybe Turbo Fast might have beat us. I think they were, you know, there was like <laughs> Bojack and then the DreamWorks the s- s- snail racing. Guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Turbo. But that's for kids. Yeah. So there's no way they would, yeah. there would be like snail nudity. <laughs> no. I mean, they're technically naked, but you know. <laughs> yeah, all snails are technically naked. But um, we were allowed to do nudity, like from according to Netflix. But Raphael, the creator of the show, was just, you know, it was like a, his taste rather than like uh, right. restrictions. He was just like, yeah, I don't want to do a show where we're like looking at them having sex and stuff. I want to convey it through dialogue or whatever. Nice. Which was actually tough one time uh, in season four. He wrote an episode with like four sex scenes and they were in the script. They were just like, they have sex. And you're like, okay, I guess he wants to see that. But then the director of the episode having to keep re-thumbing the scenes to show less until finally it was like, oh, they don't actually want to see anything. They want to just like, you know, have off-screen 
everything's happening off screen <laughs> off screen sex it's so true because i literally went through this on captain fall where oh, some yeah. of the scripts were so graphic and we and because of the way it's written as an artist you think well that i guess that's what they want and because yeah, right. like it's it you know and so you're like well i guess i'm gonna this try. is what you're asking for i guess <laughs> and then they're just like no why are you doing this yeah it's they're true. always like why are you <laughs> showing us perverted this? yeah it's like <laughs> this is word for word what you Gross described me. And it's so funny because it's like yeah i guess i guess yeah it's funny to see like it's not explicitly written in the script how you have to interpret it and so yeah that's really funny i mean i think Raphael wanted to feel like a classy show rather than like a a trashy mm -hmm. kind of adult animation like oh we're gonna show lots of like boobs and dicks and stuff you know mm -hmm. he wanted it to be like a sophisticated show that people who don't like cartoons will think is good you know yeah yeah no he succeeded i think it was like a it, it i mean to me it feels like a classy show where it's like the jokes are like very uh intricate and like the social commentary is always like very thought through and mm -hmm. shown through multiple perspectives which is i think a uh, really strong and there's hardly any horse penis there's and, hardly, and that, i think yeah, that, yeah. that was <laughs> almost <yeah. none. laughs> i was yeah. the one thing that was that i was shocked in a in, in a positive way right like in in a in a surprised mm -hmm. kind of way was a like uh how dark it could get because i feel like it's yeah. the first time we got ish, an adult show that got so dark. It was kind um, of thrilling how how much it would go in that direction. Mm -hmm. And it could get depressing to work on, too. Like, not oh, because yeah? of the, the working conditions, but, like, the content. You know what I mean? Like, you'd be yeah. like, oh, this is taking a really sad turn for the characters. So, so did working on a show uh, that was adult during, you know, your day job for so long, how did that play into with Sublo and Tangy Mustard, do you, do you feel like that had any effect on that? Or at any point, was that going to be like meant for much younger people and then you ended up aging it up slightly? Or like, 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 mm. or, or were they always, you know, completely separate? I think it was like, uh, Sublo, I never really thought too much about the demographics or anything. I probably should have. Mm -hmm. But, like, I really, at the beginning, was like, this is just a thing for fun that I want to do. So it was never, like, never even occurred to me, really, to think about, like, okay, I'm working on an adult thing, so I should do, like, a kid's thing or, or vice versa. Well, I guess you know? they are technically adults or whatever, and they go to, like, Yeah, it wound up being whatever, adult. But yeah. And eventually, yeah. I just kind of, like, it was like, okay, this is a show that's not for kids. But um, I wasn't thinking about it. I was just kind of purely trying to make a thing for myself I guess. but but you're also you're also not like flinging around submarine penis or anything yeah yeah <laughs> i mean i try yeah. to i think in a way i sort of aimed for like the same level of adult as like classic simpsons you know that makes sense where yeah. like and you know they do that on bojack too where you can like talk about stuff but you don't show it i guess although i i probably am less adult than bojack in it but you know like they say i don't know some light they say like hell and damn but there's not like fuck shit whatever sure 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 although i've written that in the scripts a couple of times and then just been like that ah, doesn't feel right i don't really want to hear them saying that they sound too mean just <laughs> although in like real life i mean we all are like you know like during the records we'll like <laughs> curse and stuff but then uh just like ah, i may as well not include that yeah talk to us a little bit about your process like making the shorts like how are how do you go about them from like getting the first idea to like writing do you write all by yourself do you have like friends that you pitch your ideas to like how how does that look uh it, the writing is mostly just it's just me but uh i do share it a little bit with friends and stuff like occasionally if i'm not sure about something i'll kind of bounce it off them like is this too far is this too sad or or mm -hmm. i don't know usually like in terms of what's funny i kind of trust myself but uh, I remember, like, with the art show one, I remember asking people, like, is this too mean what they do with, like, Katie's art at the end? Mm -hmm. And then I forget if I changed it or not. I think maybe originally they were just going to throw it in the garbage or something. And then I was like, this oh. feels too mean-spirited here. So instead yeah. they, like, find a use for it that's just not what she would want it to be. 
you're such a you're so nice <laughs> <laughs> that you that you're asking people like is my is, is the know. thing that they do in this cartoon is it too mean well because i don't I want you to lose really sweet like to see the main characters as mean you know like they're kind of like mischievous but they're not like supposed to be assholes and i was like it'd be kind of funny if they did something really mean and i was like oh, but then you would not like them as much yeah, and i feel like it's kind of in character it, more in character too because Sublo is a little bit more like he's kind of a sweeter one of the two yeah he's, he's... got a bit of a conscience <laughs> Tangy yeah, mustard he's, he's... can be just like unleashed id sometimes. Yes, yeah. I feel like Sublo kind of like he he tries to care, but he's not as. He, Neither one of them not... knows how. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they but they both trying. mean well. Uh, I feel like you know sometimes like when they glue Katie's head to the table, it's like they just thought it'd be a funny prank because they weren't thinking at all, and then they're like, oh wait, yeah, that does kind of suck for her. Oh, I mean, we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> You know, like, they can have remorse. <laughs> what? Uh, oh, but the writing, yeah. So I basically yeah. write it all myself, and then I, I write, like, a whole season, kind of. Or a small little batch of, like, first time was, like, five or six episodes, and then since then it's been about a ten. Mm-hmm. And uh, we record them all at once, and then I, it takes me, like, months slash years to, to put them out. So it can feel weird, because then, you know, you by the time you get to the end of that, like, season... You're like, oh, I wrote this three or four years ago. It's it's weird. It doesn't really reflect what I would want to do right now. That's so crazy. Do you do you ever find yourself rewriting something that you wrote? So, as you're making the episode, do you find yourself rewriting while you animate or produce it? I guess I do a little bit less because I'm like changed my mind and or like got tired of a joke or something. And more, I'm just like, oh wait, this is like a joke I can't make anymore. Mm. Like. What am I thinking of? Oh, there was one, and there's all kinds of little things like that. But uh, like in one episode, they talked about having this is so dumb and Toronto specific. It doesn't matter, but they had like metro passes for the the subway, and then mm-hmm. the in the time between when I wrote it and when the episode was when I was animating it, the company the the public transit discontinued metro passes and they switched to a different <laughs> system. So I had to just like cut that line. <laughs> But there's a lot of things like that where you kind of have to like, oh, this line is written, doesn't work. So I got to sub in some extra joke that I cut somewhere else or find some other solution here. Mm-hmm. It does happen for sure. But I, uh, most of the time it's just like as written, basically. Yeah. The, like 90%. Yeah. Do you ever come up with like something that you're like, like a new joke and you're like, oh, this is too good. I got to put it in. <laughs> yeah, this happened a couple of times. But, uh, but largely I'm just like, okay, well, I'll save it for next time, I guess for the mm-hmm. next episode or next batch of episodes the the process for the writing is basically just that i keep like google documents of like a bunch of you know little bits of dialogue or like a funny character name or like oh like a journal entry of like oh the today i went and did this and it was weird and this funny thing happened and then over time you know after like months of building that up i'm like oh okay these things would kind of fit together into a story and these ones kind of work together and then some of those end up becoming episodes and the other ones just you're like okay well i have three things that kind of work together but i couldn't think of anything else for that so i gave up on that idea <laughs> are you a, are you a journaler i try to be i go through periods where i do it and then periods where i forget to for like months <laughs> but i like what's your journaling style i'm asking because I, I i love stationary and like bullet journal and all this <laughs> <type of> shit <laughs> oh well i mostly do it digitally just like on google dot google drafts mm. A man of the future. <laughs> well, it's just so convenient. I mean, sometimes I write my dreams down in like a little notebook that I had next to my bed, but I haven't done that for a while because I feel like going on the computer or on my phone just kind of like distracts me from it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like sometimes I forget by the time I get to the computer, I'm like, Wait, what was I going to write down? Like right now, I forgot what I was even talking about. Writing the cartoon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah using a journal oh yeah yeah to, it just kind of write your cartoon like most stuff just kind of leads to dead ends but every once in a while there's like you know you, you accumulate like oh these three funny things that happened to different parties i could put them all into one party you know and then i did that party episode <laughs> so you don't have like a formal script writing like format oh, or sorry. process i do or, write a script or... after that before i stop okay, ordering okay. yeah yeah um mm-hmm. but that's like how the scripts kind of snowball into like oh and then i could you know put these in some kind of order and then rewrite that into like a, a first draft and then condense it and yeah i write it and then storyboard it usually 
and then keep refining it like with the radio plays and stuff mm-hmm. it's all just kind of loosey goosey and organic and i'm working on a bunch of episodes overlapping oh cool so you're you're not just uh doing one episode after the other you're you're working on the whole batch is it is it like you record a... like the whole season at once don't you yeah yeah we record them all at once and then so i usually board like four or five and then start animating the first one and then I try to like, okay, so I've animated episode four. That means I should be boarding episode eight or whatever, you know? You're nuts. <laughs> wow. that, 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 that's, so, that's so sick. I mean, it tends to slip. It kind of like falls behind schedule. Of like now I've only got two that I've boarded before I can animate them or whatever. But that's I, so crazy. I feel like it yeah. helps me do it to keep breaking up the tasks instead of, okay, I got bored for like a year and a half and then animate for two years or whatever. Because I yeah, just get tired of that. Yeah, you want to you want to stay kind of like you you want to kind of follow the fun. So if you if you feel like coloring or like painting a background or like then you can just kind of switch around. Yeah, yeah. There's always some other task I could switch to. That's so cool. I like that because I'm. I, this is another thing I think I said on Twitter before, but I really feel like when you're doing indie stuff, you have to like find ways to keep it fun. You can't mm-hmm. just be like, okay, this is like a huge slog. But if I work on this for five years, then I'll have a cool thing at the end. Because then. At least for me, I just wouldn't get it done, you know? Like, if every day I'm, like, hating drawing these frames, I just am like, okay, I'm going to do something else. Why would I sit here and do stuff that I'm not yeah. enjoying? What, yeah. what What are some ways that you keep it fun? Uh, Kind of, like, trying to streamline, not streamline, but shape the process and, like, the, the product, too. Like, the result of the show is kind of about what I like doing. Like, uh, I really don't, like, clean up. Uh, like even doing in betweens really so there's not a lot of in betweens i do a lot on like threes and even fours really it looks very well animated like when i lo- i i just watched them this morning and i was like man like this is like the animation <laughs> <laughs> to me it feels like you have in betweens in there it's not just like well there's you're... like a decent amount of in betweens but <laughs> do you do, just do like straight ahead do, do you not really clean up do you just yeah, kind of do I, straight ahead animation i used like on my fester fish shorts i drew it all rough and then cleaned it up i think it looked better but it also took like twice as long so i was like well yeah that's so tedious i don't know if i want to bother doing that in the, on an independent thing where it doesn't really matter anyway so mm-hmm. i just it would look better if I drew them rough and then fixed it and cleaned it up. But so all the drawings are basically just like, if, you know, if the drawing looks kind of wonky, it's because I didn't fix it. <laughs> it would look better if I did, but also the show might not exist because it would just not be fun. Yeah, I think it's like, it's so crazy because everything is so on model and <laughs> I don't know, it feels tight to me. And I guess it's also because you're doing everything. Like, there's something that I noticed is like, uh, yeah. you animate, you, you animate you you do the whole thing you do like you you don't get help to with the art of it yeah i mean yeah, people have offered you. to do it for free but i don't really have the money to pay people and i don't want them to do it for free and then be like a yeah. abusive boss true. you know <laughs> that's so that's so true i feel like that's such a <laughs> like a, if, if as soon as you're paying people then you're like on the hook or if, as soon as you're having people do stuff for you you're kind of on the hook to take care of them Freedom and i i can't <laughs> yeah <laughs> No, it's it, it's funny that you bring that up because I've I've seen that online sometimes where people would ask, "Would you ever want to do a collab?" or like, how, "Like, oh, I would love to work for free for you." It's it is kind of weird for I guess maybe because we we're like industry professionals and no, and so somebody doing free work m- might feel like you're taking advantage of them yeah. in a way. Yeah, I don't really want to. I'm the, the- the last thing you want is an article coming out about <laughs> how you have yeah, a bunch of people yeah. like working on your stuff for free and like uh yeah yeah yeah. and also i just i don't know there's certain things that i would delegate if i had the money to like i don't really like doing the sound like foley stuff you know it's so tedious animate like dropping in like footsteps to match the animation sure, like sure. i i don't even feel like i'm doing a good job of that if i had the money that would be the first thing i would pay somebody to do but I really honestly, do. I, oh, what were you gonna say? No, I was just gonna say. Honestly, I was like, I was gonna ask you about how you do the audio because, like, as I am working on some shorts for Adult Swim right now, I realize, like, oh. holy shit, audio is fucking hard. <laughs> it's hard. It takes forever. Yeah, and it and it and it can make or break it. Like, yeah, if yeah. the audio is bad, that's all people are gonna focus on. Totally. It, yeah. it like, brings so much to the short. So, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about your process of like how you do foley and stuff and uh, do you do you ever use one of those free sound databases, or do you do you make it all yourself kind of for certain sound effects that it would be really hard like 
if I need like a cannon sound or something, I don't have a cannon, but if it's like footsteps or like a door closing, I just record it myself. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, at this point, I have a pretty big custom library of just original sounds. Oh, nice. And there's usually for each episode, there's like three or four that I make a list of like, okay, I need them squeezing a water bottle or something. And then I just go do those at the end. Mm. Yeah, it's all just built up library of stuff. And they don't really sound that great. <laughs> I mean, I've realized when I'm watching, I was like, why does it not feel professional oh yeah because all these sound effects are kind of like wimpy sounding you know (laughs) they don't have like proper i don't know compression and good mics and stuff i've gotten lazy and i've just started making sound effects just with my mouth oh yeah i mean that you can do a lot with that like just i mean but but like having but it also it's funny because like it'll seem lazy but also you can make an excuse like uh it's a style thing that every time they walk it's like (laughs) <laughs> like like and and you're just making a mouth noise i do feel like however it tends to work really well because anime does that a lot if you watch mm-hmm. anime they like when they bounce or whatever they they always have kind of like a synth kind of sound exactly. so it's kind of like wee, 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 and it's not like an actual wow. it's not real sound yeah 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 and i think that's really cool mm. it, it kind of gives it yeah. more of a style i mean if you're a cartoon like why why try to be as realistic as possible in a way exactly, like it's yeah. rhetorical yeah. yeah it's like um what's the, the guy who did the sound effects for looney tunes it's like treg something treg uh smith treg brown i think that was like a big thing he would like deliberately choose the wrong sound effects for stuff which now is like you know obvious cartoon stuff but i think he was kind of like one of the first people to like really like make an art of that of like I'm gonna go for like really incongruous noises to like specifically because it's funny rather than because it's what it sounds like. Uh, and then I guess like Hanna Barbera pretty ran with that pretty hard too. <laughs> yeah, I was I was thinking about making your own stuff and trying to keep it fun. Like I I feel like it's made my cleanup style very lazy. Like like <laughs> like I like when I first was getting trained to work on shows that you know we it, it was like you know, you zoom it in at like 800% and you do like three sketch layers and like yeah, you're yeah. Like cleaning up this. And, and, and like for my own stuff, I, I try to tell myself that, that I just like the lines to look rough, <laughs> but I don't know if it's just me like being lazy and settling and like, I'm adjusting my style to like, I like the lines looking rough. I don't know. I mean, I definitely do. I really always like, there's a lot of NFB cartoon, you know, this like Canadian company that made a lot of indie cartoons. Like, the Big Snit mm-hmm. is a huge, famous one. The Cat Came Back. And I loved those as a kid. And their lines are all wiggly. And so I kind of, like, leaned into that. Like, oh, the lineup. It doesn't have to be, like, Disney's quality, smooth mm-hmm. line work. Yeah. And I liked home movies, too. That was super rough. Uh, oh, yeah. Shin-Chan is, like, really scribbly. Mm-hmm. And just, like, the more scribbly stuff I saw, the more I was like, oh, I think I like that. And I'm bad at cleanup, but that works perfectly, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like the stuff that, that looked like it was, you know, meant to be on new grounds or meant yeah, to yeah. be on, you know, like that, the, the old, like, I mean, I, th- I feel like this, is, I've brought this up like two times in a row, but like Batman, Piterman, that, oh, that sort Batman, of like, Piterman. like yeah. super loose. That's a huge so influence. Good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like, uh, one of the first... I can actually see that. I can see that a lot, actually. It's like one of the first indie things or indie shows, you know, that I was aware mm-hmm. of that i was like oh yeah you could you could do like a whole series of shorts that's so true i feel like when that came out that also kind of broke my brain i was just kind of like holy shit people are doing that and yeah and they're putting a lot of of work into it and making something like kind of like completely free form and like yeah and it was like an whatever. internet thing that wasn't like just like flash symbols sliding around you know it was like hand-drawn stuff mm-hmm. which there, i guess there'd been others like the the Spidey, the Adam Phillips and stuff. But that was one of the first things that I was just like, wow, like yeah. you can just do that. <laughs> you know, you could just animate a whole thing as yeah, a series. Spidey was like very intimidating because it was very finished. And yeah. I think when I remember looking up Adam Phillips, it said somewhere in his bio that he was like a Disney animator or something. Yeah, you're like, oh, he's legit already. Okay, well, that's why yes. it's good. I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Or it's like Bam and Fighter Man. I think what's inspiring about it is like, Oh, maybe I could do this if I worked really hard. Like they're clearly <laughs> super talented, but it's like a style that approachable. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I don't know about you guys, but I think for me that's something that's always inspired me more. And when I see something 
and I'm like, oh, this is super cool. And I know I can't do this right now, but if I try really hard, maybe I can try to do this. I yeah. think that's super inspiring. I love being able to see that humans made a thing. <laughs> yes, that's the word. That yeah. it wasn't yeah, like, yeah. this just somehow exists, yes. descended from mm -hmm. the heavens. It's like, oh, I could see that like somebody kind of drew that line and smudged it a little bit or whatever. They kind of fucked mm -hmm. it up. How <laughs> how 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 would you say you got over that initial like cuz you went to, you went to animation did you go to animation school? Yeah, I went to a tiny school in Toronto that I I think still exists um called Max the Mutt Animation School and they it was like a career college. They focused mm -hmm. a lot on like general art abilities like we did like oil painting and stuff, but then we did a bunch of animation too. But I was already kind of animating and making shorts by that point. It's like a a, a big a big hump that I feel like a lot of young people and people graduating need to get over is sort of this idea that everything that they make is a portfolio piece oh, yeah. and sometimes that can actually hinder how much you're making or putting out and so this stuff that we're talking about about you know having a cartoon where you're you're allowing it to be a little more rough where you're allowing mm -hmm. it to not be super fluid or have rigid cleanup like i feel like these are all things that like uh, someone who just comes out of school and is like trying to really prove themselves in animation is like worried about and a lot of the times it's the thing that makes it so that like after their you know senior thesis they just never like put anything online yeah again or like you uh so how did you like get over that like like or did you never have that barrier <laughs> you're always just like i'm just gonna like put stuff out and like who cares what people think i or? think because like probably a lot of people who did it as teens were like this where you it didn't occur to you that like anybody was really going to see it you know so there wasn't a kind of this has to be a perfect mm. thing like i'm not presenting myself as like a proper industry animator who i want people to hire i'm just like a, a dumb kid putting shorts online and then that kind of gradually transitions into like oh wait somebody did see it and they said they liked it or whatever you know so so it got a little easier to get over that but I still, all the time, I'm like, oh, I'm actually terrible. Like, I shouldn't be, uh, <laughs> shouldn't be paid for this, you know? That's crazy. That's so funny. Like, the imposter syndrome is real, right? Yeah, totally. Because, <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, like, I guess, I mean, probably somebody has, like, asked this question uh, in our listeners. But how do you kind of balance both, like, working on these shorts and working professionally? Because from YouTube, Dentizilla ask how do you balance between working on your indie projects be versus being an animation director because it's both really time consuming yeah for sure well it was i actually felt it was easier to do that when i was working full-time on bojack because it was such a clear clearly divided thing where it's like okay between oh. you know when i'm at the studio i'm working on bojack and then evenings and weekends and mornings or whatever i'm doing my own stuff but now that Mornings. I just... Mornings! Yeah, sometimes. Well, I lived really close to the studio. That helped. I okay. lived like a 20-minute walk away, so I didn't have a bad commute. Oh, because, nice. Because like, when I moved to LA, I didn't know anywhere just else. Trying to, fit in, trying to fit in three drawings while you drink your coffee. Yeah. And sub -blown tangy. I would, I would do keys in the morning for like 20 minutes, and then I would do all the in-betweens for that at night when my brain was like falling apart. Wow. He's fast. He's fast. <laughs> I feel like every time we have a guest who says like, oh yeah, like on my commute in the train, I would just be like writing all these stories or like, I, <laughs> like I'm like so impressed with that like work ethic because it's like, you know, like let me just like warm up with my own personal project before I go for like 10 hours of like more work. <laughs> it's hard to compartmentalize. I mean, I am, in, I am impressed by that. But doing mm -hmm. stuff from home like even just working remotely let alone doing freelance as opposed to being on a whole show i do feel like it's harder to switch it up because there's part of you that's always like well if i'm animating i guess i should be working on my work and not my own thing but i don't know at this point that's i'm so pretty rough. i'm pretty good at like letting myself do my stuff <laughs> i don't know mm. i mean i have like do a patreon you, stuff I like... so i feel like it is its own legitimate thing too you know <laughs> yeah do, do you ever um i don't know i the the way that I usually separate that is I usually I usually put my own stuff first and then I end up having to stay up too late doing the work stuff. Well, in a like, way, that's I, kind of the thing, yeah. Because like if I I know that if I stay up really late doing the work stuff, I'm just gonna say like, all right, I'm just gonna bed gonna go to bed. My own stuff can wait. Like I'm tired. Exactly. But if yeah. I do the stuff that I don't have to do first. 
I'll, and then and then push the other stuff till late. I'm like, but I have to get this done. Okay, I'll <laughs> stay up and do it. Yeah, I've know? done. I've been there. I mean, I've done both. Like, you know, there's a lot of times where I'm like, no, obviously my job comes first. But sometimes sure. I do. Uh, you know, I'm just like, oh, I'll work on my thing first, and then, like you said, like you know that you're gonna get the other thing done because you have to. But if you don't have to work on your thing, you might just not. And then you're like, oh, I wish I had done something on it today. Yeah. What's your um? How do you? What's your main motivation to do your personal stuff? Like, and it can be anything, you know, it can be just kind of like inspirational or materialistic, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's not a lot of materialistic concern because there's no money in it. <laughs> like, if I'm yeah. lucky, someday I'll, I'll start breaking even on it, you know? <laughs> But yeah. um, uh, I don't know. I guess I just, like, even if I wasn't working in animation, I'd still want to make cartoons. Mm hmm. I, but the motivation is a good question. It's just fun. Like I said, it's just a thing I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. Like if I enjoyed playing video games as much, I might just sit and play video games all day. But I, I just happen to like working on cartoons and like drawing and, you know, find, like I said, I find ways to make every aspect of it a fun activity to spend my time on so mm -hmm. that I'm never like, oh, I guess I have to go draw some in-betweens. I'm like, okay, well, I'll draw some in-betweens and like listen to a fun podcast or whatever. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I mean, there's this part of the motivation is that you just want to, like, express yourself, I guess. You know, you're like, oh, if I do this thing, I can, like, show what I think is funny and my view of the world and how I perceive people or whatever. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it is just like, oh, it'd be funny to draw a thing where this dumb thing happened. When you say that, like, there's not money in it, I noticed when I was watching them that you haven't monetized your shorts. Oh, like on is YouTube? There... Yeah. Yeah. Is there a reason why? Uh, I should. I guess part of it is like insecurity that if I like put an ad in front, people won't bother to wait for the video. <laughs> <laughs> so there is this part of the industry that is somewhere in between making shorts and working with a company where either a studio will fund your idea and own the characters and the IP or the, the studio will license your thing or or whether they and the studio will either license your cartoon or own your characters or pay you to make the thing or agree to have some sort of deal with you where they promote your thing and you promote them or whatever. What's your experience being sort of like half in and half out of making like the indie cartoons but like working with like a studio mm -hmm. i kind of was trying to get to that because i saw that it existed you know there was stuff like shut up cartoons and cartoon hangover mm -hmm. mondo media mm -hmm. and i was sort of like that might be a good fit for me because i was thinking like i don't I, you know pitching a sh huge show and having like a team of like 40 people making it seemed kind of unattainable especially at the time but you know mm -hmm. maybe like doing a thing where you get a few thousand for a short and you could hire one person to help with it seemed like a thing that I could do. So I was kind of aiming for that. And I talked mm -hmm. to a couple of companies. I actually, the first episode of Sublo, I showed it to one of them as like a, because they were looking to get some pitches from me on something. And I was like, oh, this is a thing I really want to make. I think it'd be fun. And they were just sort of like, oh, we're not really interested in that. So I just kept making mm -hmm. it myself. But I was in like a sort of a weird contracty kind of thing with one of those companies that sort of, you know, it's kind of that weird gray area between indie and industry. And it didn't really end up benefiting me. <laughs> so mm. I, I ultimately was <laughs> like, I think I'd be better off just doing it independently. And mm. I, I think some of them might have found a way by now, but at the time it kind of felt like the more I talked to them, to just these various companies, they were also kind of like, yeah, we don't really know where the money exactly is coming from now either. Like, uh, we're, we were kind of <laughs> This hoping... isn't lucrative for us. I don't know why we were doing <laughs> well, this. Well, it was like yeah. a thing where like some of them shut down because they were like, yeah, we had like an initial yeah. investment. And so we were able to make a few shows and pay people. And then we thought it would become sustainable sure. and it didn't. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll just do it on my own anyway. Then like, you don't have any answers. <laughs> That's yeah, so all my first pitches were to studios like that. Yeah, because it's when like because it's easier to get to those than to like pitch to Cartoon Network or something, right? Mm -hmm. When you're starting sure, off, and, and, especially, and it's it and it always feels funny because the you'll have studios that feel like that that feel kind of picky, but the mm -hmm. thing is, they want the stuff that feels more like the artist. So you're like. Well, like you don't want my idea, but you want me to do something that feels just like me. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. for you, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, it it's, was tricky. That weird. was kind of my experience too. 
they'd be like, yeah, we love like everything about your sensibility. We love your style, your sense of humor. Just like do whatever you want to do, just do it for this us. One. And then I gave them ten, and they were like, not that one, not that one. Just keep coming back with more. Maybe like number fifty-five, we're gonna like. And I was like, oh, just do one of these on my own. Yeah, that's so funny. That's so interesting that it's because then you 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 have to do the grind of like pitching again and again and again, and yeah. and then you. I think it's so frustrating as an artist when you you have all these ideas and then you get excited about them and then you pitch them and then they get turned down and then you're like, well, all of this time I spent creating all these ideas, I could have maybe like made one of them. Yeah, exactly. That's how I always felt. I was yeah. like, I may as well just make it on my own and start right now mm -hmm. then spend like two years pitching and redeveloping, retooling and then pitching to like a new exec. And then finally making it, and it last like eight episodes and then dies, you know? Mm -hmm. It's such a treadmill to get stuck on. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been close to having Sublo and Tangy Mustard be something outside of YouTube? Yeah, there's been a couple of times, like, maybe more than, maybe like four times or something that I've pitched it. And I just feel like, yeah, I never really, you know, there's always a few meetings and you kind of would get strung along for a while. And they'd be like, yeah, we like it. But they were never like, oh my God, we love this. Let's make this right now. It was always kind of like, okay, well, if you keep telling us what we want to hear and giving us different uh, versions of the same thing, maybe we'll like one of them. And I was, I was already making it on my own each time, so it was kind of took away a lot of the the excitement of like, wow, like maybe I'll get to make it. It's like, well, maybe it, I'm already making it, you know. <laughs> did did it did it feel beneficial to have so much of it made already, or was it a drawback that? like they felt like they couldn't develop it as much with you because so much of it was fleshed out already. I could never really tell. Uh, I mean, I asked them, I was like, do you want me to, <laughs> you know, I've got a lot here. Do you want me to have a I lot? I can unmake this. Yeah. I was kind of like, you know, I could, <laughs> I could treat this as like season one starting over from scratch, or I could sort of assume that people have seen the original shorts or whatever. And they didn't really seem to know most of the time. They were oh, like, it's cool that you were flexible." Yeah, uh, I mean, I, like I I feel like I would have had to be. I had no no cachet to be like, "You need to do what I say." You know, it's entirely like, just tell me how you want to do it, and maybe we'll do it. And then we didn't. <laughs> I think it's so hard doing these meetings because, like, it can be so different from like a development exec to another. I feel like sometimes you you have to kind of be like. You still have to be flexible, but you have to be like, this is the reason why this is so awesome and so great. And I believe in this so much. And isn't this blowing your brains? Like how good this is? Yeah, there's a, definitely a sweet spot of like, I know exactly what I want this to be. And I'm very firm on that. But I'm also totally willing mm -hmm. to compromise on everything. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what, so tough. what is the balance they're looking for exactly? <laughs> I think it does vary at certain places. Like some do kind of, when Netflix was starting, especially they really wanted people to basically have like a fully formed idea. Yeah. Mm. And they were like, you know, we don't develop, we just green light and you go no pilot or anything. But then Whoa. Mm -hmm. a lot of places are more like, yeah, we just want you to have like a sketch of something that we can help you fill out so that it mm. can be a thing that we both want to make, which kind of mm. almost, I don't know. I don't know what I like better because neither of them have worked for me. <laughs> what, what would, what would be an executive note that would be your like, hard line like it like do you, do you have things that um shows do that are like your big pet peeves like like oh, uh, like if they were infinite, if they were yeah. like sublo and tangy sublo and tangy they need to no more costumes <laughs> i don't i don't know what it, i don't know no what it is costumes. there <laughs> right yeah uh, man there's definitely certain things but at this point i have kind of given up on pitching it because i i like just doing it on my own and mm -hmm. and uh i'm so attached to what it already is that i don't really want to give that up and yeah and start over with like, oh, maybe it's a different version where like Katie's a different character or Mr. Woo Bomber's different. Like it all just kind of is what it is to me. But mm -hmm. um, in general, I feel like if I was pitching a new thing, I'd be a lot more flexible. Mm -hmm. There's there's so many things. I think it's really important to know what you don't want to do in making any show. Like they always say that yeah. about like making the original Office or making Seinfeld. That those shows kind of developed from them, to, like from. Ricky Gervais and Steve Merchant or Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David just discussing like like shitty shows and what bugged them about them. Like, what do we not want to do? You know, <laughs> I think it's important because just... if you're if you're like, I love everything. Every show is great. Then like, how can you know what makes your show unique? I don't know. Does that make sense? <laughs> I'm just imagining you you pitch the show now and having an executive say, 
well, that submarine going to the Titanic incident just happened, so <laughs> it's a little bit too soon <laughs> to have like a sub show. Yeah. We're gonna need to change the sub character I mean, to like something different. Like Sublo is so like Sublo and Tangy Mustard. Everything about it is just so arbitrary. I don't know if I can justify any of it as like really like this is why this show has to be this way. It's all just like, well, this is what I wanted to do, so I'm doing it. <laughs> you know. Do you feel like Tangy Mustard was any part of the reason why you got involved in Tuka and Birdie? Yeah, for because, sure. Because it's a it's a bird type character. <laughs> Not specifically the bird thing, but I know Lisa said early on she liked Sublo and Tangy Mustard, oh, okay. uh, at least visually, and she wanted to have some of that feel to it. Like she wanted it to uh, have like a more hand drawn quality because her stuff is very organic and hand-drawn looking her actual comics but bojack wasn't it was very like flash mm -hmm. puppety and so uh she wanted me to incorporate some of that in, in tuca and birdie so you know i did like the opening and little interstitial bits in the episode she said that she liked like all the weird dances and stuff that they mm -hmm. do <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll do some more of those on two. I was Birdie. wondering in the conference episode, they're, they're walking towards the camera in a way that's like super crazy, and it reminded me of the dan of the opening of Tuka and Birdie when they're like walking together, oh yeah, side yeah. by side towards camera. And I was like, which one came first? Was it the uh, Sublo and I think I did Messer? the Tuka intro. Actually, it would have been around <laughs> the same time, but I think I did the Tuka intro first. But I'd done similar stuff to that. In I think episode eleven, the art show one. Mm -hmm. There's a bit where they're like doing a this goofy walk towards camera too. But that was just mm -hmm. kind of a thing I pitched for the for the intro that like they're they're doing this goofy weird giant stride walk. <laughs> I don't know. I just tend to default to a lot of the same stuff. No, I just I just thought that was funny, and it's a, it's a great animated moment too. Like it's so it's so fun. That episode has like a that episode is the only episode where you have guest animators. Yeah. Uh, I liked the uh, idea was... of doing that, like of, of having guests. Um, I think from reading comics more, like where they'd be like, oh, we're going to have like a little side strip drawn by some friend of the artist. I thought that would be cool to do on the show. But I was thinking of like a dream sequence where maybe something could like a way to justify it looking different. So it didn't just suddenly feel like the immersion was broken mm -hmm. and Sublo having this weird mental breakdown thing <laughs> seemed like a good way to incorporate that. Cause just because I knew, uh, like, I wasn't going to be, like, giving people notes on, like, the style and stuff. I was just kind of like, yeah, do whatever you want, because I'm not paying anybody for it, you know? <laughs> yeah, that was so fun. That's such a fun sequence. And somebody, like, did, like, a full-on 3D guy, too. Yeah, uh, I was really <laughs> impressed with what people came up with. I, w I was wondering, too, like, talking about 3D real fast, like, do you use any 3D for your shorts? Like, sometimes I see, like, the trains and stuff, and I was wondering if that was a uh, blender or anything. Or no, if that's all it's all on. just 2D. Um, It's just... I really like a lot of kind of perspective-y trick stuff. So, I, sorry, I'm just getting distracted by drawing again. <laughs> <laughs> so I I just try to do stuff in Flash that you wouldn't naturally necessarily choose to do in Flash. Mm. It's all just figured out. Some of it uses symbols, like um some of the trains use some weird symbol stuff. It's not all totally hand-drawn. And I use like perspective grids and things like that. Mm. I'm a fan of those tricks where you kind of make something look 3D, but it's a 2D trick. And I feel like those things are really interesting to try to learn and implement because especially when you're like storyboarding or something, I feel like knowing how to do those things sets your show up with or your scene up with like a, a plan versus sort of saying, like, oh, like we'll make it in. 3D yeah. And then and Comble then like figure something production out. has to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. There was stuff on Tuca where because they knew that I did some weird flash tricks, like in episode two of season one of Tuca, there was a thing where there's a video somebody's watching of like cars slowly turning and sliding around on ice and they bump into each other. I think it's just a video Tuka's watching or something. And they had me do that because I knew how to do fake shape tweeny stuff or symbols that kind of can look 3D for like two seconds. And then beyond that, it kind of, the illusion is broken. But that's all you need. You just need those two seconds and then you can cut away. Yeah, you're just like, okay, she's watching a video where this car is rotating. That's, that's all. <laughs> and then you don't have to see them fully rotate. That's what I look up on YouTube. <laughs> Cars rotate, yeah. Cars, cars rotating on YouTube. <laughs> Love it. My favorite video. Oh my gosh. Oh, I, I could definitely. Oh, dude, there's gonna be 
people who really do that though like you know all these like <laughs> like like car crashes and stuff like they're, they're, that's like a big subgenre of like youtube like, well there's the people that like to just watch cars turning around not damaged on like a and then there's people like on a turntable that... thing at like a <laughs> auto show or something yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah a lazy susan yeah lazy susan <laughs> like, <laughs> but for cars you know what <clears throat> we're gonna go from talking about silly cars rotating to some really deep shit <laughs> because on twitter lucky four four star asks what got you into animation and what does the art of creation means to you oh, that's a big question <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, i think what got me into animation is just i always liked it uh, as a kid and my dad liked it and you know there's just something i mean it's so cheesy but there's just something so magical about seeing like drawings move or things that you know don't really exist moving and like seeming alive like just hearing myself say that i'm like oh what kind of glenn clean glenn keen bullshit is this <laughs> but it's true you know like <laughs> the art of creation yeah yeah you know when i see things come from my pencil it's like i am god or whatever but it does kind of like it's exciting you know to to be like oh this thing didn't exist until i made it exist and now I look at it and I believe that it exists, you know? That's that's cool. Do you feel like they're your babies? <laughs> yeah, in a way. Or at least friends that I care about. Actually that was mm -hmm. this isn't really answering the question, but when I was doing when I was writing the third season of Sublo and Tangy Mustard, I was like the peak of the pandemic and I was just missing hanging out with friends in real life so much that I was like, Oh, this is a way like doing more sublo is like a way that I can feel <laughs> like I'm socializing my with friends. my friends. My fake cartoon made up friends. And oh my cartoon God. versions it's, of my real friends a lot of the time. It's so true though. I feel like when when you stick with characters for a long time and I and I relate to this through my webcomic, it feels like the characters take a life of their own and then they become mm -hmm. real. And then yeah. I don't know if you feel that way and if that's a reason that you keep doing Sublo and Tangi for so long. Oh, but for, sure, yeah. for me, I feel like if I don't draw my characters, they die. And it's like, <laughs> they're sad. I, I, I animate my characters giving me compliments. <laughs> has affirmations. And I listen to Sean, them. Sean, you're morning. a cool guy. Sean, Looking good. Sean, you're so big and cool. <laughs> you're and big and cool. Strong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely... Uh, part of the motivation for doing the show kind of changes at a certain point from like, oh, I want to like see what this character would look like to oh like I, I love these characters and i want to see them progress in their lives you know mm -hmm. so like one of the things that i do now when i'm writing new seasons for both seasons two and three i think is i wrote like okay like where are they like where are they trying to get in their lives like what are some ways that i could generate stories from that like like you know the art show episode was like okay katie's an artist like what's a story i could do about her trying to achieve more as an artist being in an art show or like, you know, you start just like writing stories that are like, well, naturally, if they're like trying to do this and they're here, then maybe they're going to want to do that. That's so vague. <laughs> but, but you know, mm -hmm. like it, they do kind of start taking on a life of their own. You're like, well, I know what they want to do. So I'll just do a story where they do that. Was, was it an, an homage to the Office episode with Pam? No, I never really watched the, U, at the U.S. Office. Uh, I heard later that they did an art show episode, but and it, it's probably uncomfortably similar it is, it is it is it is not i mean no it's nothing like yours <laughs> but, <laughs> okay that's good. I, I was and i was mostly joking but i i was just i was i was, I was just trying to think of oh yeah yeah other i heard there's um, shows with art shows i heard there's a it. bob's burgers art gallery show episode too but i never i haven't watched much of that show either i've seen a lot of thanksgiving episodes at, at thanksgiving parties you want to talk about episodes we haven't seen let's keep going <laughs> 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 I kind of wanted to, I don't have a good segue for this, but I wanted to kind of get into that question from YouTube from at uh, Zin Stars, who asks for any up and comers, what would you say are the pros and cons of industry work as opposed to indie work? I think that's a cool question. Yeah. Well, with industry work, you get paid, like for sure. <laughs> with indie stuff, it's a little bit of Hell a question yeah. if you'll make any money doing it. And for me, the answer is... Not really. Like, I kind of am breaking even with the Patreon, but but mm. I certainly can't live off of it, you know? But I would say, like, the industry stuff, there really is something... It's tough to say, because all my indie stuff uh, is just me. But that's not necessarily true for most indie stuff now, where you, like, have, like, a team that you're on. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's largely, like, working on a fun thing that you do yourself, where you do exactly what you want, versus 
A, making money, but B, working with a good team. And, you know, there's just it's so fun to, like, work with other people and collaborate. Um, so that's, like, yeah. the big reward, the industry stuff, because a lot of the time the stuff you're working on is less creatively fulfilling, but you'll you'll be making money and making friends and stuff, <laughs> uh, which is kind of cheesy, but, you know, kind of true. But th- that's a big part of animation, though. I, and, and that's something that I think a lot of indie creators miss out on a little bit is, like, like to make these shows you need like 50 plus people yeah and it's yeah. this way to like meet all these people that are like-minded and who you can become friends with and learn this sort of thing this this way of working that is collaborative and you let go of your ego a little bit and you let you, yeah it's just all like hey i we're ma- we're trying to make the best cartoon put your idea on top of my idea, change my idea with yours. Your, your idea is even better. Exactly. You know? It can't like, you really can't. I feel like some people are not good at that. At like accepting that it's not going to be purely your thing when you're working with other people. Like you have to have room for other people to, you know, collaborate and like come up with uh, their own contributions and things, Yeah. which is, you know, that's like the great part too, is that it reflects uh, like it's more than the sum of its parts when you do stuff in the industry, hopefully <laughs> depending on the show. <laughs> There's some shows where you're like, oh, this doesn't reflect any of what we're good at. It's just kind of like we were forced into this box. <laughs> yeah, and that can water it down or it can be additive. Yeah, well, it, it can it be can additive. It can feel though. like a megazord. It can feel like a megazord of ideas and people or it can feel like, like a slop. <laughs> yeah, Just right. a big old slop. It kind of depends on what the parameters of the show are. Like, is it a show that is trying to let artists contribute stuff or is it a show where you just have to have like 50 artists not do what any of them are good at (laughs) you know true there's always kind of a balance there but yeah i don't know i like both i like going back and forth between both i feel like they encourage me to do the other one because when i'm doing indie stuff i get i I miss doing uh, things with other people and when i'm working on industry stuff i'm like well this isn't the show i want to make so i'll go make my own show again (laughs) yeah (laughs) Man, do you feel like, okay, because this is something that I've observed in myself, and I wonder if you feel the same. Like, do you feel like having your personal project, your personal animated show on the side helps you be invested to a more reasonable amount on your professional work? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Sorry, you can finish what you were going to (laughs) say. No, I was just going to say because I, 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 I feel like when I started in the industry and I don't know if you've ever experienced that but I feel like when I started in the industry I would give it like a thousand percent in my day job and it was kind of like ride or die yeah and and I don't know if that's very healthy <laughs> yeah exactly because you like I feel like if you do that you're always going to kind of be disappointed <laughs> by either like the show didn't come you know like I boarded this thing to hell and then like the overseas animation didn't quite live up to what I wanted or like Mm -hmm. the producers didn't like my ideas. So uh, they didn't use them. Like I've seen a lot of people really like stress and agonize over that of like, like I came up with this great thing and then they didn't use it. What the hell? You know? Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to be like (laughs) accepting that whatever you do is is hopefully going to contribute to what somebody else wants. And if it like fits into that, then great. Which like on Tuca and Birdie, Lisa was great at, she had like a strong vision for a show, but she was also so good at incorporating other voices into that. And, you know, she didn't have any ego about like, oh, this idea didn't come from me. So it's not the show. It was like, mm-hmm. hmm, like, does this seem like something Tuka and Birdie would do? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll have them do it. That was really cool. But yeah, you have to just be okay with like, not, not everything you do is going to get into the show or come out the way you want it to be when you're working in the industry. Mm-hmm. Because it's something that I get, I don't know, I feel like as people who are very creative, like, I feel like it's a specific type of profile that we have because we, we do both. We, we always do kind of like industry work and on the side, we have our personal projects and compared to like, for example, sometimes you lend a job and then you're perfectly satisfied with the job and then that, and then you have completely different hobbies Mm -hmm. and you're able to kind of like separate the two. So I, I think it's kind of interesting to kind of talk about that a little bit like because there's so many kids that go to animation college and think and then i'll be a showrunner (laughs) and that's you know (laughs) yeah which is 
which is great and shows that there's like a strong creative drive but there's only so few places for showrunners like you I don't, yeah like I, you can't there's you have to be able to accept that you're maybe not going to be a showrunner at least not right away <laughs> mm-hmm. which is part of why i do indie stuff because i do want to be a showrunner but i'm okay with it being smaller scale exactly yeah i love i love that i love the way you said that that it can be s- smaller scale and that's fine it also helps that my thing is so uh unambitious in scope you know it's like monday and slice of life friends getting into trouble if i wanted to do a giant fantasy like epic like if i wanted to make avatar i don't know if i'd be like i could just do that indie that's fine <laughs> i might be a little more driven <laughs> to do it in the industry <laughs> I guess unless if you do it like One Punch Man, like in that style. Yeah, you know? yeah, like the, the original uh, comics and stuff. The, the comic, yeah, yeah. And the original comic style. That's... Yeah, because I was about to say in the animation style. Yeah. No, not the anime, <laughs> the webcomic. For me, yeah, yeah, so that's yeah. another thing. For me, the webcomic One Punch Man is way more inspiring than the official Shonen Jump version or the anime. Because even though those look amazing and great, I'm like, well, this almost, it, I mean, it, it looks too crazy. Like, impossible for me to do but then i look at the webcomic and i'm like yeah i could probably do that <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i okay we have a question about youtube that I, I i wonder if you have thoughts on somebody from twitter asked if so at emmy nemi asked do you think the youtube algorithm shift in 2012 to drown spam truly killed animators and short form creators for a while i feel like it probably did i mean i don't think it's ever really recovered from that i, I forget if this was the same thing but you know that point where it switched from like video mm-hmm. views to like time watched or whatever i oh, think yeah, that huh? did really mess it up because so many people were like well i just i can't do enough content that fast to uh to to win that way <laughs> you know so mm-hmm. um i don't know for certain things they're super successful it is but that's just like so far off my radar of what's attainable you know like there's some people who put out a thing and get like five million views immediately and i'm like okay well that's just not going to be me because <laughs> with that maybe you still could make the money directly from youtube but mm-hmm. i feel like my approach is more just like oh i make a thing and i hope that people like it enough to support it on patreon mm-hmm. or i should do merch I've, I still have barely done any merch but that's how a lot of them end up doing it too, right? Just because yeah. the video, you know, like that's why so many animators became Let's Players, right? Well, yeah, it, it seems like the pivot is like a combination of merch, Patreon, and sponsors on the videos. Oh, like, yeah, like yeah. Official sponsors and less about like, because it's so easy to have your video demonetized mm-hmm. that like anybody depending on YouTube views seems like impossible. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do feel like the merch can can really help out. And from all the past interviews that we've done, it it sounds like the winner is kind of like prints because they're not too expensive to make and you can sell them at like a reasonable price point. Yeah, that's a good idea. Easy to mail. When you're selling Sublon Tangy mascot heads. <laughs> full, so like full, officially full licensed suits, ones. Full, yeah. yeah. Did you actually, ever get any cosplays? No, I maybe one katie or tito or something like something easy but nobody's done sub yeah. and tangy mustard no one's made a full cost a, a full <laughs> costume of a, i wish a... i would love to see that tito is so funny he's such a funny character to me i don't know why i love these kind of like deadbeat characters they're just like i don't know when he like plays his music <laughs> it's just so funny to me yeah he's he's a lot of fun to do he's kind of tedious to animate because he moves slowly and stuff you know <laughs> i like mm-hmm. i like characters who are like really floppy and fast and stuff but he sort of like just sits there and slowly like in the nightclub episode there was this bit where he's like standing there eating cereal really slowly and it was just so tedious to like animate cereal nobody's ever going to be like wow great cereal eating you know but it is like a lot of mechanical it's like having a character ride a bike or something there's nothing oh, like impressive God. about it but but it's such yeah. a that, that's thing. one of those scenes where you have to use one of those 
tricks where you put the camera really close and you just tween the arm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's just like like a like really of the hands slow. Coming in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you you were you uh you wanted to torture yourself and you were like I'm gonna yeah animate well, each hand. I have you weird... were like Glenn Keen. <laughs> <laughs> I have weird feelings about like I feel like it's more satisfying. I, actually, I hear myself saying this. It's not that weird. It's very obvious. It's more satisfying to see something actually happening than like to see the, like the suggestion of it you know like i just think it's funnier sure, sure. I to it. see him mm. doing it because i feel like there's like a sliding scale of like yeah. show, not so much specifically about him eating but just my like philosophy on animation in general where like you mm. see somebody so you do want to see the bojack sex i uh, <laughs> maybe maybe it depends on who it's with <laughs> i was a- i was animating it on my own <laughs> just for myself i brought it I in and showed it. my own for some reason you didn't want to put it in the show <laughs> no um, i did this on my own you know there's like a animation that's very kind of like poppy and flashy where it's like character will just kind of like whip over to a thing and like pop their hand up and be like oh by the way blah 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 you know like smearing and stuff mm-hmm. sure and that certainly has like uses but i just think in terms of like like especially if they're communicating a quick joke or something and sometimes my stuff leans yeah. more that way if i'm depending on what it is but i also really feel like it's super satisfying to watch a character just do something mundane yeah and like see it actually like oh wow they broke down the steps of him doing this task or whatever it like adds a layer of believability i feel like you're like wow this this character must be real because they wouldn't want to animate this <laughs> I, I almost i almost feel like it's like adult artist version of playing with dolls like it like you have your little guy okay, yeah. in the stage it's your doll house and you get to like, I'm going to draw this little pose out over and over again, full body. I could cut in and make this a lot easier, but it's it's fun to see his full little guy, you know, yeah, eat the yeah. cereal. I love that you had a shot of, I think it's in uh, Tito's girlfriend episode where like his eyes do a full like 360. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is, I was just like, wow, that is galaxy brain. So funny. I like weird <laughs> stuff like that, that like, um. Like little turntables. I was like, is that because he's a DJ? And I was like, maybe it's just because he's stoned. But I was like, yeah. So. I think that was like to reflect his weird state of his weird uh, chemically altered brain yeah. that moment or something. But it does kind of work with him being a DJ, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I like stuff like that where when this is like you know classic cartoon staple of like showing the character like externalizing their weird inner like how they mm-hmm. feel. And making that visual by doing things they couldn't do. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's also like just so subtle and quick. It's funny. It's almost like it's almost like if you don't pay attention, you you might not catch it. Kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, almost like subliminal. Yeah, it's like subliminal and tangy. Um, <laughs> subliminal uh, and tangy mustard. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, <laughs> it's it's almost like the visual representation of that um that sound effect thing that we were talking about. Exactly. Yeah, where, yeah. Where we're having a sound that isn't the thing but you get it like for some reason it still makes sense yeah totally it fe- it like um feels like what it is more than it, like actually represents it in like a concrete way you know what i mean mm-hmm. basically what you said but stupider <laughs> not as well said <laughs> <laughs> i uh i think we kind of touched on this question a little bit before but it's a good question so i want to kind of like uh, ask it again on twitter pk walsh walsh ask uh You've talked about how you'll record multiple episodes at once and then work on them before recording new ones. Do you ever lose track of things or have to do retakes because your plans for a certain episode change? So I guess like kind of like the production side of your mm. of your process. Yeah, there have been times when I had to like change stuff. I don't think I've done a lot of re-recordings with everybody because I'm always so afraid that like that they'll say no to recording more because it's like just my friends and family and stuff. And I mean, I pay them a little bit, you know, not enough for it to really be worth it. It's like entirely just favors to me. And they're, they're mostly pretty into doing the show, but I'm always kind of like, Hey, do you want to record more sub low? Uh, and then they're like, yeah, sure. But I don't want to hit them up like every, every couple of months. Like, Hey, can you record like three lines? I wait until I have like a significant chunk of stuff for them to do usually. <laughs> Um, so I try to just like figure out other solutions, either like editing other lines that I have or uh, just cutting the bit that's not working or whatever. So there's a couple of episodes that I recorded or that, you know, we all recorded that I haven't actually made. 
that I like. I mean, there's many that we've recorded that I haven't animated yet, but there's ones that I'm like just dropped and I'm like, I'm not doing that one. So I take little bits from those every once in a while to fill holes, you know? Oh, interesting. Yeah. I wonder also kind of, I noticed that like your episodes kind of vary in length a lot. Sometimes you have episodes that are under a minute. Sometimes you have episodes <laughs> that are kind of like around the three minute mark. And then you have like very long episodes. There are six minutes or more, yeah. <laughs> which is, which that's kind of the beauty of putting stuff out on YouTube. Cause you could never do that on network TV or like cable TV. Cause they have like a very specific set amount of minutes. You have to do 11, you have to do seven, 11 or like 22s. Mm -hmm. There's not really any other way to slice it. I guess the question would be, what's your, your thought? process for that is it just that it, sometimes you just have like a small idea and you do that or is it just like a way for you to ramp up a season like is there it's a little bit of both there like uh i do like to start the seasons with the small one just so i can get something out quick mm. although i say that and then nothing is ever quick because it's all just me doing it in my free time but like <laughs> that's the idea though like i'll start with the little one to get some get the ball rolling mm. and i just uh yeah i don't know i like being able to do it any length that the story kind of feels like it needs to be i mean that's one of the things where you're like well if i'm not getting any money really to do this i mean i kind of stopped saying that because i have a patreon but you know I'm not not profiting from this so i may as well just make it exactly what i feel like it should be so mm -hmm. so sometimes you have an idea that's like oh this is only two minutes long and sometimes it's uh, 11 <laughs> so you just kind of ignore the kind of artificial restriction of like it has to be a certain length because the network because there is no network mm -hmm. um yeah i don't know i think it's fun i remember reading uh what was it uh simon hanselman's meg mog and owl comics and i liked that kind of mm -hmm. unpredictable quality to them where some stories are like two pages long and then sometimes mm -hmm. you're like wow this one goes for like 20 pages you know and, and sometimes you think it's done and then you're like wait there's more <laughs> i thought that was like the punchline so i kind of I was already doing the show by the time I got into those, but I sort of leaned into it more. I just like having that variety. I like that you don't have to have, like not everything has to be a huge story with like a B plot or something. That you, mm. you can tell a story that's just a little vignette of them fucking around or something. Yeah. That's a great way to like build your characters too and like their friendship and relationship. It's funny because at the beginning you started them like they kind of meet on the job and then it's <laughs> like you have the picnic episode where they like Sublo is very like emotional about like his friendships with his co-workers kind of as if like I don't know he doesn't really yeah. have like a lot of other people yeah yeah <laughs> hangs out with <laughs> uh, oh yeah I remember somebody wanted to you know, draw Moses wanted me to draw a scorpion and a lobster fighting or something but I forget what those <laughs> both look like so I'm just gonna it's gonna be bad but anyways yeah I mean this was the whole thing originally where I thought it'd be cool to show their friendship building over time and then i ended up compressing it into like two episodes i was like there wasn't much point in that really <laughs> just their friendship arc is like like zero to, to 100 yeah. i mean sometimes that's how friendships are you know i, I think yeah. that's also relatable yeah yeah like there's been times when i become friends with somebody and i'm like dude we're so close and then and then they're like we're like acquaintances <laughs> <laughs> you know like and oh, I'm, no. I'm like, <laughs> But yeah, that and, and I'm like, I feel like I can tell you anything, dude. And and they're like, we like have hung out once. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I feel like this is so funny. I remember like reading a study about that, like how they like tested people out. Like you have to kind of rate, like kind of how you, how close you feel to your other friends and stuff. And a lot of the time it was not like reciprocal to the same amount. Like, oh no. For sure. That's so scary. That's so scary. Yeah. I'm like, oh, maybe nobody's really friends with me. <laughs> But I mean, I definitely, there's lots of friendships where I feel like, oh, I probably like them more than they like me or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyways, I, <laughs> I try to, uh, <laughs> you know, that's like, if the show is about anything, which it kind of isn't, it's kind of just about friendship, I guess. And like mm -hmm. the development of it over the show. Like when I was writing the picnic one, I was like, oh, this like, this is about them being friends. Haha. <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I love friendship comedies that give you enough time to just like hang out with some characters while they do nothing exactly and yeah. I, I think that helps you get to know characters so well like, like there's a lot of shows where like it's so plot heavy that you never get to just like hang out with them yeah totally and i feel like that's one of the the best things about sublo and tangy is oh, and, and one of the reasons why it's so cool that you can start them off and they're just like 
okay, episode one is they're just like out front of this <laughs> thing, you know, out front of the shop, and and they don't know, to each know each other's names, other, and like stuff, having yeah. a picnic. Or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think that's dope. And then you can have an episode that's as long as you want. If if you're like this is fe- feeling too like rushed, you know, uh, that's cool. The uh, it's funny you say that because that was such a pet peeve of mine about I think it was Star Trek Into Darkness. Like, that's just the new Star Trek reboot movies that are now not new anymore. But that was such a thing that I noticed with them that was no time for, like, actual character interaction. Other than, like, Mm -hmm. one or two, like, quips in the middle of, like, an action scene. And that was, like, some of the the most appealing stuff about Star Trek before was that it mixed, like, you know, sci-fi stories and all that with just, you know, fun times hanging around with, like, Captain Kirk and Spock and McCoy and stuff. But if there's not, no time for any of that, you really lose some of that richness of like, oh, I can't wait to see what yeah. Spock's going to say about this if there's no time for him yeah. to say anything. I always thought of Star Trek as the show Friends in Space. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, all, they're all in this space apartment. They're all in the people are going to be so apartment. mad that yeah. said that. <laughs> yeah. so yes, Star Trek funny. is probably Chandler. very inspired by Friends. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, you set phasers to stun again. <laughs> I kind of um, want to make a little bit of a, uh, I guess, left turn into uh, music because you you do all the music for oh, sure, Sublo yeah. and Tangy Master. And we have a couple of questions. I'm going to kind of put all the questions together because our patron brother to drummer asked, does music ever influence the creative process or seeing a picture makes you think of music or hearing some music makes you think of visu- a visual idea, et cetera, because music is the best. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> There's definitely been times when, on the show, when the music kind of informs something. Uh, I mean, there's like the one where they have the dance battle. That's like the most mm-hmm. obvious thing. What else? There's there's little bits here and there. I think in the convention one, there's a few moments where I sort of thought of music first and then built a scene around it. And then definitely the uh, the theme song for the show kind of affects you know how I start the episodes in a way. Mm-hmm. Like when I did the theme song, I wanted to just sort of feel like you were like. I don't know if this reflects the final song, but at one point while I was writing it, I wanted it to feel like you were just walking by a bunch of storefronts that were all playing little different bits of music and you'd hear them fading out and into each other. That's oh, a cool that's cool. Direction. So there's like a yeah. part of the song that I don't usually use in the show that actually does sort of have a bunch of little samples like fading in and out that sort of reflects that. But the main song is just kind of a own different thing, I guess. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting that you have like a whole track that you haven't entirely used. So there's <laughs> yeah. like a little Easter egg right there. <laughs> I got to put out the full soundtrack. I'm sitting on a lot of music right now. Wow. Because <laughs> I've recorded longer versions of most of the stuff in the show. And then I just haven't bothered to put it out. Oh, vinyl release. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so cool. Man, I do like vinyl. I should look into how much that would cost. Oh, that would be cool merch. Uh, that's also <laughs> cool stuff to put on. Like, I don't know. Have you ever put it on your Patreon? I feel like that would be a cool, like, little thing to have on your Patreon. Like, all the, like, yeah. longer or, like, bloopers and stuff. I'm going to. Yeah. I've been, like, preparing it and, like, making little notes for the tracks and stuff. But, yeah. I uh... Oh, and then the nightclub episode. There was a ton of, like, music informing, like, the, the tone of the scenes and stuff. Just because, you know, there's music all through that one and stuff. And I, for that one, I recorded, like, 40 tracks and then used, like, 20 of them or something. I just, wow, every that's day, crazy. I, if I, like, had an idea for, like, oh, I could do, like, a minute and a half generic EDM track, I would record it and then pick which ones I wanted for which scenes. Damn, I want to listen to all of them now. A lot of them were very low effort. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me miss that makes me miss making as much music. It's hard to keep up everything. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like sure. when you just try to do everything. And I think that you're somebody that somehow does manage to keep up doing everything, <laughs> even if even if it, you know, takes a while to do. I think that that's probably a reason why a lot of people, a lot of artists like look up to you. Well, that's that's cool. That's good to hear. I it doesn't feel like I'm doing everything. It always feels like whatever I'm doing, I'm neglecting the other stuff, you know? <laughs> but then I guess How many more jobs can, can can you do on the cartoon? <laughs> How many more jobs do you need? <laughs> Just before you can say you're doing everything. <laughs> Well, I'm not doing accounting on the cartoon. I'm not doing, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, when Aaron I, can do all the voices. Oh, God, that'd be my nightmare. I really don't, <laughs> I don't want to do voice. I mean, I've done voices on my old cartoons, and I do the odd voice in Sublo, but I uh, I don't really like my voice or or want to listen to it to animate, you know? 
<laughs> yeah, everybody that's listening, Aaron's using a voice changer right now. Yeah, my voice is actually <laughs> like actual several voice. octaves uh, deeper. It's actually way deeper. Than that. I'm just trying to sound normal for the podcast. There's this like fun question from Cartoon Cure on Twitter who asks, have certain songs ever influenced your character creation? Songs influenced? I feel like Tito I kind of came up with around the same time as I was coming up with the song. <laughs> the, like, the yeah, beat, yeah, yeah. like, wah, 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 you know, so I was so sort funny. of like that, you know, it kind of came about as a way of like establishing his character <laughs> that he's so like, man, look at this awesome song I made. And then it's just garbage. <laughs> It's just stupid Coming noise. Up with theme songs for individual characters <laughs> is such a fun soundtrack idea because I, I, I started realizing that a lot of like there are cartoons, especially like anime, that does that. Oh yeah. Or you can look up the Cell theme song or the Boo I theme love that, song, yeah. Or Goku theme song or whatever it is. And I love that idea that like each of the characters, like when they have a shining moment, that they have a theme song about them. That's really cool. Mister Wu Bomber's kind of guy theme. It's got some like Mellotron choir samples in it, but I've only used it a couple of times. There's not a lot of like I used to try and compose more like that, and then I just found that there's the way I use music on my cartoons. There's not a lot of spaces for like a you know a minute long. Here's Katie's theme or something. You know, you might have yeah, like she's coming, she's walking <laughs> up. You know, you might get like you know a little like ten second sort of like suggestion of a theme. But I ended up kind of giving up on trying to use light motifs. But Woo Bomber does kind of have one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like there is a thing that there's a, literally a track I think called Woo Bomber's theme or something, <laughs> or Grumpy Woo Bomber or something. Oh, that's so funny. He's so funny. He's like he's such a he's such a a funny character. There's a moment when he comes in and he just like drinks the nail polish remover, and I was like, oh, I thought he was gonna die. Oh and yeah, then what he's he's, <laughs> he's in the dashiki from the drum circle. <laughs> That was based on, uh, well, not the drink in the nail polish, but the <laughs> fact that he's wearing a dashiki is just based on this guy I saw on this on the streetcar one time, and he was like the palest guy, but he was wearing like a full dashiki costume, and I thought it was really funny. And he was on the phone, and he said, "Hi, mom, I'm on the way back from the drum circle." <laughs> I was just like <laughs> trying not to laugh. Mom, mommy, can you pick me up from the drum circle? Mommy? Yeah, it was like, hey, mom, can you like get stuff ready for me when I come home from the drum circle? <laughs> can you put out my bowl of Cheerios? Yeah, that's hilarious. And I'd also animated a short for uh, MTV's greatest party story ever, where a big part of the story was a character wearing a dashiki. So I was like, yeah, I want to draw Wu Bomber wearing that. <laughs> what well, what was what was that era where? everyone was trying to make just like party stories. Oh yeah. Cause there cartoons. was uh, cause there was vice party legends. Yeah. Was that at Starburns? Is that what that, that one was? was? Maybe it was six point vice party. Legends. Cause I remember yeah, there were like two or three at the same time. Maybe it was Starburns. It might've been Starburns. Yeah. yeah. Cause one of them, ours was just random like teens who shouldn't have been talking about getting drunk on TV. But, uh, but like one of them was like celebrity specifically. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was probably the better one, <laughs> the more interesting one. Uh, wh which celebrity did you animate? Oh, I didn't know. I'm saying the one I worked on was just random people being like, "Hey, uh, one time oh. I got really drunk and then I vomited on my mom's head or whatever <laughs> after she picked me up from the drum circle." There were there was a new version of that over at Titmouse where it's car stories. Oh yeah, yeah, and they were doing this special premiere at like a you know like a fancy car show with car heads and like like all the car magazines and stuff were were there but it's basically like stories from like exhibit and like like different different like comedians <laughs> and celebrities that are just like telling like car stories that they have that's pretty cool and i was like whoa i was like whoa th whoa, whoa there's a demographic for this there's people there's it's people that like everything yeah. fancy cars and cartoons holy shit <laughs> Talking about niche, I guess, interests, maybe what would be your thought on this question by Luke Other Dukio from Twitter? Mm -hmm. They asked, first, I love Sublo and Tangy Master. Do you feel like with the recent breakout success of Digital Circus, Hell of a Boss, et cetera, there are signs that there's a growing viability to indie animation or oh. are they anomalies as animation seems to be increasingly corporate? Hmm. Which is funny you said increasingly corporate. I feel like it's... It's already about as corporate as it can get, right? Yeah, it's yeah. always. I mean, but it's also always been. I mean, like, there's always been companies making. Yeah, yeah. Right? 
Or uh, maybe they're thinking that like indie animation feels corporate. Mm, uh, yeah, I, I won't say anything about any specific shows, but I do feel like there is a. I mean, that's kind of interesting. Just the way that like indie shows have become such a thing because maybe I said this already. Like when I started, there was no model of like shows. Like there was Batman, Spider Man. There was a few, mm-hmm. but it didn't seem like there was like any established way of making like a like series. web series, yeah. kind of stuff. But like animated specifically, you know, like, so I was kind of looking, cause I was looking up like how to make a cartoon web series and there was like nothing useful. So I had to just sort of figure out my own way of doing it. Mm-hmm. But I feel like now if you look, there are people breaking down like, oh, here's how, you know, Hell of a Boss or like Lack of Daisy or uh, Digital Circus, like how they're doing it. There's people analyzing it mm-hmm. or just interviews where they talk about it, which I couldn't mm-hmm. find before. <laughs> But I, it feels like if I was starting now, I would look at those and go like, okay, like how are they succeeding? Because they seem to be kind of sustainable. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there was nothing like that at the time that I started. It was just sort of like, I don't know, start animating the first one and then figure out how to do more, I guess. <laughs> I feel like the first one I had seen was like Salad Fingers, man. Yeah, or, yeah. Um, teen, teen Girl Squad. Oh, Homestar like, Runner like, for sure. Kind of like that Homestar Runner, mm-hmm. maybe. Yeah, but I mean, I love those. Yeah, there wasn't like a model for it. Necessarily. There's like Homestar Runner, Salad Fingers, Amy Winfrey was doing like muffin films and like making fiends and stuff, but it didn't. It felt like they were all kind of very different approaches. Yeah. Was a um, Happy Tree Friend originally a YouTube oh, yeah. or New Grounds, and then became? Yeah, yeah. Up or was it always corporate? No, I think it was online first, yeah. I never really mm. saw that one, although I actually ended up working with the creator of it on Tuca, and he was a really nice guy. Oh, yeah? Great, really? Yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah, Ken wow. Navarro. Well, I, I am seeing more and more kind of like indie internet animation stuff that is being like approached or, or turned into like cartoons on on tv like yeah with, like, smiling friends with mm-hmm. with hell of a boss or i feel like people or, or is it has been hotel yeah has been hotel them, yeah which, yeah yeah that's the one that that got picked up by a24 and amazon mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i feel like yeah there weirdly i always kind of assumed that this wouldn't be the case but i think it kind of is that if you just sort of model it and the format of like a proper show it goes a long way <laughs> like i always thought like one of the cool things sure. about doing indie is you know that i could do one that's two minutes and then do one that's like 10 minutes and mm. you know just kind of post them as i make them but those ones that do sort of like save stuff up and then post an episode a week they they, they work better you know <laughs> like you build up an audience mm. more that way and uh and having them be a consistent length gives the audience kind of something to anticipate so they're not like oh i thought this would be a long one and it's like 30 seconds mm. do you ever get these kind of comments on your shorts not really like... i mean one person i think one or two said that the that one that is 30 seconds long was like this doesn't really feel like an episode i feel kind of ripped off and i was like that's fair that is it was kind <laughs> of like a joke to me i forget what the question was exactly about the viability to it like it, do you think do you think there the question is like is it, it is is it more valuable now or are the big successes anomalies? Uh, I mean, I definitely think has been hotel and, you know, the like maybe three or four big ones that would come to mind are anomalies, but I think mm-hmm. they're inspiring a lot of people to try, which, you know, mm-hmm. they weren't even trying before because there's just no model to emulate. So I guess it's, it almost feels too early to see if they are anomalies or not. My gut mm, says probably, yeah. <laughs> but uh, mm. it's definitely happening more than it used to. I, like I can yeah. think of like annoying orange was an example that was early on. Right. Yeah. But I mean, you have like Yolo Crystal Fantasy. I and love Yolo. Yeah. Friends and you know, the smiling Skibbity friends. Toilet is fucking huge. Yeah. <laughs> and whatever you think of Skibbity Toilet, it's it's huge. Yeah. Huge. It's probably bigger than most shows. Oh yeah. They yeah, have like actually, over fifty million you know? views each episode. Yeah, it's, it's it's incredible. Oh yeah, but like I said, I don't know if it's like we'll see in like two years or something if if uh, mm-hmm. other shows can kind of emulate those successes. But, uh, it's also like really cool little shorts like uh, Natural Habitat. I don't know if you guys have seen these. They're like small shorts. They're 3D, uh, but they, they're they made to look like 2D and they're like little critters. And I don't it, think I've seen they, that. They, they make each uh, episode as like a, a fun fact, but it's written as a little sitcom with critters that's highlighting oh. the fun fact about like like a ferret or like, I don't know, a uh, like, like a robin or like a like special 
little critters. I think and, I've seen um, maybe stuff like that, not that one exactly. But I have seen yeah, some things I, that are like each one is like twenty seconds long, and they just pump them out really mm-hmm. regularly. Well, yeah, well, that's, that's the interesting thing about like the animated series on like a TikTok or something. Exactly. Yeah. Is is someone it it like someone can make. 15 second episodes and no one's like why is this so short yeah, yeah. like it, like <laughs> like it makes sense that it's that short on tiktok and then the animator can make a short thing and then have the same characters over and over again mm-hmm. and maybe even like make a little puppet and be able to keep it up so so i think that is interesting i don't know how monetizable that approach is but it's interesting but you have all these like shorts that are so like under one minute and then you can upload them on youtube shorts yeah in the yeah. vertical and the, uh, youtube yeah, pushes yeah. the shorts really hard from what i understand they do they really do <laughs> like they if you make it a, a short they'll they'll show it to more people than if you make it like a traditional mm-hmm. youtube thing mm-hmm. yeah i mean i'm i don't want to say a luddite but i am like it's not on purpose but i am like pretty increasingly out of step with that stuff because it just, I don't know, like the stuff that I like, none of it is really that 15 second kind of thing. You know, I like stories with characters. I would have probably like a lot of the stuff that inspires me the most, like indie wise, is all like uh, individual shorts on like, uh, you know, specific creators and stuff. But like a lot of the, my favorites make like short films rather than the series. I mean, like Joni does, like my friend Joni does uh, both. But usually you're either doing a series or shorts kind of. And uh I don't know. That's the kind of thing that inspires me more. But then I couldn't really think of any stories that that worked for a short. I was kind of like, well, I have these characters. Maybe I'll do a series with them. But if you have like a, a standalone short that you could do in like festivals and stuff, like I find so many of those really exciting and like inspiring. I I have two questions for you, but first I'll get to the questions that uh, because you were talking about people that were inspiring to you. Jar of Jelly Alt on Twitter asks, "What is your personal favorite indie show?" Oh, okay. Out of, like, contemporary stuff. I mean, I love A Fox in Space. That one's so cool. And I love that he's doing his own... Like, it just feels unlike anything else, that one. Joni, like I mentioned. Joni Phillips. Mm-hmm. Worthy Kids. Does great stuff. Mm-hmm. Scum House. They're cool. Felix Colgrave. I don't know if he's done any series, mm-hmm. but like I said, like, a lot of shorts. Jack Stauber. Mm-hmm. Bridge Kids is cool. I like that one on Newgrounds. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm trying to think of... There's a lot. I mean, I like a lot of them, but, you know, it's always hard to think of specific names. Yeah, I know. Those are great names. And I have a follow-up question for you from Stringa1000 on Twitter, who asks you your favorite animated YouTube series. Okay, series specifically. Yeah, specifically series. That's, like, contemporary? Because... If it's of all time, probably Batman, Spider Man. It could be an old yeah, one. Yeah, I think yeah. it's like YouTube. It's just like a like indie series, so it could yeah, be. Yeah. yeah, I really liked Making Fiends. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's so many great ones out there. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking we could get back real fast into talking about industry stuff, thanks to some of our YouTube questions. Thug Shed asked, what was the process of directing an episode like? And specifically, I think that's about BoJack. So we'd get the, we'd go to the table read. That would probably be the earliest time that we'd get involved in an episode. Maybe we'd have some rumor like, oh, there's going to be an episode coming up where they do this. You know, we'd basically discover it at the table read. That was like when we were hearing the story and the jokes for the first time. And then um, after that, you'd get like the, you know, whatever, the first proper draft. And have like a week to do pre-thumbs on it where you design new locations. And I mean, Lisa would probably handle any new major characters. But, you know, if there's like a a big scene that takes place in like some specific office or something, you kind of figure out what the layout of that office would be because, you know, you're the one who's going to be figuring out the blocking. Mm -hmm. And also this is that's like your chance to sort of take to pitch any big swings like, oh, I think we should do this part in like a different style or something or. Or do it all from somebody's perspective or whatever. Like a lot of the big creative choices happen with the pre-thumbs. And then uh, sometimes you'd have your assistant director involved in that too, helping out. Especially if you're behind schedule, which we often were. And then, you know, you do uh, like a sort of pitch meeting at the end of that week with the supervising director and the executives. And they'd give you feedback and then you'd take the feedback and start thumbing out the episode. And you'd usually have like two weeks, I think, to thumb it with the, you know, with the board team. And then three weeks for revisions, I think. And, you know, you get their feedback. You might have to re-thumb a few things. Mm. And then, like, a week of revisions or something. 
I don't know. It's <laughs> it's sort of just a, the mechanical process of it doesn't sound too exciting. But it's enlightening. <laughs> yeah, and I like that you're talking about the pre thumb thing because I think that's something that's not on a lot of shows. I know because we had a lot of people from Bojack, from Shadow Machine on Captain Fall. I've experienced this a oh, little yeah, bit. Oh, yeah, right. But... Yeah, I work with uh, Adam. Yeah, Adam's great. Adam Parton's great. Uh, we did an episode with Adam, by the way. I heard it, yeah. Listening, so. Yeah, he, it's so cool. It, he He's such a fun guy. Yeah, I was just chatting and, uh, with him last night. I, I love Adam. He's the best. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, he's so cool. He's he, he's so funny. And uh, and Sam, Sam Gray, uh, she had an episode too on the show. Oh, yeah, she, I, I listened to that one too. I love Sam. Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> so everybody listening to the Aaron Long episode, you'd have two other episodes queued up. Yeah, you got some homework. Uh, Adam Parton is a Creative Block episode 109, and Sam Gray is episode 70. Cool. And um, basically, yeah, so like a lot of shows don't have what we call pre-thumbs because working with them on Captain Fall was my first time ever experiencing it, where like I feel like on your typical kind of show, you go to a meeting with your directors and all the board artists and then you just kind of sometimes do a table read which means like you know everybody get assigned a role reads the script and then you get like a couple of directions from the ep and then you you're right off to thumbs right off the bat yeah, but yeah. can you like tell us a little bit more about like the pre-thumbs and how you go about it and kind of what that meeting is for because i thought that was a really important step in production yeah. that I wish more shows implemented, honestly. I like it a lot, yeah. Because it's not that expensive. You're only paying one person for one week of work about it, basically. Mm -hmm. But it can just avoid a lot of pitfalls of like, oh, we like storyboard. We did rough storyboards for the whole episode, and then it turns out you don't like this idea that we're, we're pitching, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. a good chance to be like, hey, we were thinking of, you know, whatever. We were think we Anything you're thinking about how to do it for the episode... You just kind of run it by them there, and then they're either like. And it saves your storyboard artist some guesswork. Some guesswork. Yeah, too, because you've already like going down the wrong path. Yeah, you've already kind of laid out like even before you're actually thumbing the scenes, you're sort of showing them okay, like this is the, what the room is going to look like, and I, you do like some blueprints probably during that point, not actually technical ones, you know, but like good enough to kind of be like, oh, there's a door on this side of the room, there's a window on that part, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And. uh Sometimes I would do little bits of animation for it if I was like, I think this character could like move in a certain way or something. I remember doing a little bit of that. I remember also, this is not useful information, but as Bojack and Tuka went on, I did these like increasingly ambitious like title pages for my pre-thumb packages. I remember doing one that was like some classic like punk poster with like Bojack characters' faces pasted over the characters. Posted, you know, posted over like <laughs> Sex Pistols or something. Wow. I think. Oh, it was for this this movie, The Great Rock and Roll Swindle, and I rewrote the text so it said The Great Six O Seven Pre Thumb or something. Uh -huh, that's so funny. And I think at that point, the line producer was like, "Maybe spend a little less time on these and a little more time on the actual work." Ah! Oh my gosh! <laughs> Called out. Yeah. Called out. Wow. I was like, yeah, you're probably right. I'm just, I'm just trying to enjoy my job. Yeah, you gotta find ways <laughs> to make it fun. I can't remember any that really were like a big disaster. Like, you generally, I think by the time I started directing, I kind of knew the show well enough to know what mm. kind of things would be a crazy big swing that they would hate. And it was more just like, you know, if I have like, if I pitch a big idea, they'd be like, okay, we're okay with two thirds of this, but maybe don't do this specific aspect or something. Mm. Like easy stuff to tweak generally. This is going to sound like bragging, but I felt like I understood how to make the show pretty well by the time I started directing. Yeah. Because I'd been working on it since the beginning and been witness to like all of them figuring out, okay, it turns out we don't like it when we have characters do this. Mm -hmm. You know, because you'd be the person getting that note that's like, oh, I have to reboard this scene somebody did because it turns out they don't like it when characters face away from camera or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's so funny. That's so true. I feel like like that is like a very American style of storyboarding where yeah. it's like you have to see the face at all times. Otherwise, who's talking? Yeah. yeah. How yeah, are we going to yeah. know what they're feeling if we don't see him frowning? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you had been on BoJack at the beginning and saw sort of like what a clusterfuck, like <laughs> learning how. I didn't say that word. The beginning of it. <laughs> I'm okay. I'll, I'll I'll rephrase. When you were when you were when you were on BoJack and the beginning was 
it didn't go as smoothly as it could have been. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. uh, what what was it like then going on to like a, a Tuca and Birdie, where now now that you have all this experience and then beginning mm. a different first season process? Yeah. Uh, um, now that you knew what you were doing, Tuca was quite a bit easier to make because. It was like a lot of the same crew that had been making BoJack for five years. But that was also a little bit a hindrance, I think, because everybody was so like, oh, yeah, we know it's just BoJack, blah, 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 that uh, Lisa really wanted it to feel different. But everybody was sort of not on autopilot, but like on BoJack mode, you know, and they were like, oh, it's the same you art keep style. drawing these birds like horses. Yeah. <laughs> well, like specifically, uh, she wanted it to, like I said, she wanted the animation to feel more loose, but also she wanted the whole storytelling approach to be looser and uh, and not as linear. So we got mm. a script, and for the first two episodes, Amy Winfrey did episode one and I did episode two. And we both kind of finished at least boarding, or finished thumbs. Maybe we were still boarding. And Lisa was sort of called a meeting with us where she was like, I'm not super happy with how it's going. You guys are doing fine, but it's just like, it feels too much like BoJack. It feels too linear and uh, too just mm. kind of mechanical, I guess. Like, you're just following the script. And we were like, yeah, we thought we were supposed to. That's what we do on BoJack. And she said, you have, like, the greatest note possible. was, like, go back through and, like, just add your own stuff and, like, add weird transitions. And, like, mm. rewrite the scenes a little bit. Maybe she wouldn't use the term rewrite. But, like, pitch your own gags and stuff. And, like, uh, I think they did specifically say, like, throw some detours in there. Like, just mm. make it feel more anarchic and like fun because it felt mm. a little too stiff tonally so that was like the nicest note you could hear it was like have more fun you know and oh, like do whatever so cool. you want yeah uh-huh so it's so almost a little bit of a taste of like a storyboard driven like it's like a hybrid yeah kind that of, was they specifically bit, yeah. said we wanted to sort of be a hybrid although it ended up i mean it was still very flexible but i think as it went along that process got a little more baked into the scripts you know where they were like and then sure. a funny visual thing happens rather than leaving the space for the artist to decide when that would happen. Uh, we were still free to, but, you know, it started to just, you know, you know what kind of show you're making at a certain point, and you start writing that show instead of sure. writing a different show and having the artist sculpt it into it. Mm -hmm. But the first, the very beginning, it was funny because it was almost like we were doing a shit post of, like, the real show. Like, we, because we boarded, like, straight version, and then we, like, did crazy stuff on top of it, where we'd go back <laughs> into the scene and, like, just mess things up or... Or add extra dialogue, kind of being like, that was a stupid joke or whatever. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. And she was into that's it. It wasn't cool. like she was going like, what have you done to my precious script? She was like, oh, you made it more fun. Uh, it was that's a cool, that's really good collaboration on that show, I thought. Would you be down for a quick round of questions? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, speed round. Like a, like a lightning round? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll speed speed running through the last questions because i because we had so many good ones and uh, I, I do want to give a quick shout out to everybody who took the time to um to type out something mm -hmm. so uh are we ready yeah let's go <laughs> let's go so from patreon we got Cress asking when will sublo and tang and mustard come back uh i want to say as soon as february probably late february but probably not a full Ooh. episode realistically there'll be like a short thing, and then a long thing coming a couple of months after. Wow, that's so soon. You heard it first on Creative Block, everybody. <laughs> exclusive, exclusive. Exclusive. From our patron Puzzle Glum, what were the most notable production differences between working on BoJack compared to working on Tuka and Birdie? I feel like you kind of like mentioned that. but Yeah, yeah. Kind of we got more freedom so on Tuka. Nice. It's like the chains of realism were lifted off, and we could have plant people or, or characters standing on the side of a building or whatever. That is actually really cool, standing on the side, kind of like a spider person. Yeah, yeah. we did that kind of stuff, <laughs> I think, yeah. Uh, from Instagram, Artsy Fartsy Fun Times is asking, your animation for Sublo and Tangy Mustard are so loose and fun. What, if any, drawing exercises helped you get to that fluidity in your animation? Uh, I think I draw the most fun loose stuff when I actually properly warm up and like do some copies from either like a life drawing book or just screen grabs of other animation that I like like Kimono Zume or Mind Game or something, just to kind of like do a couple of drawings to get me into the the direction I'm trying to go with my stuff. That's really cool. Nice. Yeah, that's really good. Like just like a quick little thing where you, you you get inspired and you don't think too much. Yeah, yeah. 
from Inc. KG, what were some interesting experiences working on Bojack, Horseman, or Toucan Birdie? That's a tough Fun one to speed story. around. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but, Maybe somebody stole your sandwich. I don't know. <laughs> uh, one time, okay, this is pretty quick, and it relates to our uh, everybody's friend, Adam Parton. He, uh, one time he brought in a signed drawing from, no, it wasn't by Matt Groening, but it was like a Matt Groening style caricature of him. And he left the room. Me and Mike, the supervising director, immediately like made a photocopy of it and hung it up in the same place and drew all over it, like defaced it, and like gave him a mustache and like a monocle and stuff. And he oh came back in, God. and this was like season five or six. And he was so used to all the like everybody always pranking each other that he just looked at it and went, "Oh, you made a photocopy, cool." And then he ripped it down, and the real one was underneath. <laughs> oh my God. He just saw through oh, it immediately God. because we were so. <clears throat> also, one time I made a fake uh, wiki for a. A show that we all were joking he had made in Australia called Funny Duck, and <laughs> he was like not into that. He was like, "Why? Why are you making this fake show that I created? It sounds so <laughs> shitty." <laughs> but sadly, this wiki for Funny Duck has been deleted from from Wikia dot com. Oh, Real? No. That's crazy. I still remember bits of it, but it's like all gone now. <laughs> but we were like always making dumb stuff or pranks up there in the director's room. Man, I that's the thing that I realized like moving to the u.s i'm like i i have no creativity for pranks <laughs> uh. <laughs> i feel like you develop it on the job training you know uh, you yeah, learn from right. the people around you i'm gonna go to some prank workshops and get my pranks chops uh a little <laughs> bit <prank> more <laughs> workshops, yeah, yeah. yeah the animation guild should do those yeah groundlings groundlings prank <laughs> workshop <laughs> Instagram. So I don't really understand this question. So maybe you'll understand it or we can skip it. But on Instagram, Kevin the Don asked. Uh, <laughs> He's the voice of Tangy gonna... Mustard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when are we going to get donors? Uh, donors? Yeah, donors. That's a Canadian Turkish thing. We'll probably okay. get them like the weekend after next and we'll go to the place that his dad likes. Okay, now I understand. <laughs> is it, it instead of texting you? Is he just <laughs> asking to hang out? Yeah, he just wants to ask a question block. for the show. <laughs> but that's that's the voice okay. of Tangy Mustard, Kevin Dillon. Yeah, <laughs> man, good one. <laughs> From Twitter, Thy Maniac asks, "Where do you plan to go with Sublo and Tangy Mustard?" Well, I do want to kind of slowly move all the characters' lives forward a little bit. I think by the end of the season, they the law have like started making some progress. I don't want to change one things. One person will die of old age. Yeah, somebody will die at the end of the season. <laughs> no, 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 nobody's dying. <laughs> but uh, characters are going through some changes in their lives. But not in this season. It's not too much because I didn't want it to change fundamentally, like what the show is. But mm. I want them to not just feel like they're stagnating. Mm. Well, you talked about you joked about dying. That next question by Murder Chong <laughs> is thoughts on the episode of BoJack when he does the eulogy. Oh. I would say probably nobody really wanted to do that episode. Nobody, <laughs> director wise, like everybody was <laughs> like, you could have that one where he's just standing there talking. Oh no, you take it, you know? Because, I mean, I guess it was just such a weird choice. Like an animator probably wouldn't make a choice to have like a whole episode. That would definitely came from the writer's idea, you know? And we were sort of like, I didn't work on that one, but uh, Amy directed it. Was it easier to board, though? Because it's just I think it was easier thing. to board, but there was always an awareness that it would be hard to do retakes on it because each scene would be so long, mm. you know? It's like, mm. sure. And also just that it didn't feel like there was room for a lot of visual fun with it, which I think they ended up finding okay. some stuff. But that was a that was one that we were sort of passing back and forth like a hot potato. <laughs> like, oh, no, no, you, you would be the best for this. I insist uh, you should be the one to direct it. <laughs> so funny. But Amy is also, like, objectively the best director on the show. So it was like, everybody was kind of like, yeah, Amy should probably do it. She'll find a way to make it good. Quasi Maddie on Twitter asked, uh, do you like to play Tower Unite? I have your o OCs in my condo. That's so funny. <laughs> I, uh, I'm sorry. I don't even Humble know. brag about the condo. Yeah. I don't even know what Tower <laughs> Unite is. But I'm glad you got my OCs in your condo. Red Tarek is asking, would you ever pitch a show to a mainstream network? Uh, I've tried, kind of, half-heartedly. But I would probably rather just do indie stuff and work on a mainstream network show in some other capacity. Mm. Art of Joe 1 asks, which piece of art are you the most proud of and why? Maybe uh, my DMX meets David Bowie short, because... 
that one I was able to enjoy the most because it wasn't like my ideas. It was like putting together ideas from two artists that I love, you know? That's so stupid. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> so I'm able to like enjoy that more with my own stuff. I'm like, oh, that was a dumb thing. Why did I have the character do that? I like this one and you kind of touched on in the episode, but you can kind of like synthesize it, I guess. Or Fish Fan 2 asks, well, what were your inspirations for your choppy, squiggly animation style? Oh, there's a lot of stuff. There's, uh, like I said, some NFB stuff, Big Snit, Cat Came Back, and other stuff that those directors did. I love Crayon Shinchan, Masaki Yuasa's stuff. A lot of anime from like the early 2000s, like Studio 4C and Madhouse kind of stuff. I'm trying to think what other big things they would be. I like some old UPA stuff too. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I like a lot of cartoons. It's hard to say. <laughs> I I like the thought of you getting offended by that question. You're like, what do you mean choppy, squiggly <laughs> style? Oh, undeniably choppy. And <laughs> like squiggly. you're not aware. Like you're not you're not aware that you draw what do you like mean? that. Like my stuff is clean. I thought I was like Why, I don't... the Canadian Glen Keith. <laughs> <laughs> the Canadian Glen Keith. <laughs> I'm going to give a quick shout out to my name is JT and Tremon647. Unfortunately, we might not get to these questions because I uh, want to kind of spend a little bit of time on at Mbika Art, who asks, how do you think the indie animation landscape has evolved since you started Sublo and Tangy Mustard? Oh, well, it's definitely evolved a lot in that there is like fan base for it now there didn't really used to be as in the same way i mean you know there are people mm-hmm. who would go on new grounds or look at people's stuff on youtube but now it feels like there are people who are like identifying as like i am an indie animation fan i like hell of a boss and black and daisy mm-hmm. and that's part of who i am you know mm-hmm. as opposed to just i like cartoons or whatever like there's people who specifically are like indie stuff is my favorite so that's kind of cool uh I don't know if it really fundamentally changes anything for me, but uh, but it's interesting because it's this it's like such a clear shift of like before and after all those shows. Mm. Do you feel like you've had more people find you after like all of those shows uh, came out because people were like kind of like hunting for indie animation? Or... Yeah, maybe. Uh, it still feels like I mean I, I know certain people have found it that way. I don't know if it's really more people than would have found it otherwise because mm. I feel like my show doesn't really hit a lot of the same boxes for people like if somebody's looking for something like lack of daisy i don't know if sublo and tangy mustard is really gonna <laughs> deliver what they're looking for because it's just dumb nothing you know but it's uh it's good for the the medium i guess that there's more people interested in it i think that's like a nice inspirational thought to leave the podcast on like that people are more interested in it and it's it's kind of inspiring for creators to create more stuff now that there's more of an audience out there who's like looking for this stuff yeah and i think the more successful indie stuff there is the more like we kind of were talking about there's becoming a more of like an established legitimate way to monetize it whereas before Mm -hmm. like when i said when i started i was like i don't know how to make any money with this whatever i guess i won't and now there's like <laughs> strategies of like what you can do, which is good. Uh, do you get creative block and how do you deal with it? Yeah, Real fast. yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, okay, still speed round. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess try to do different things. Like I said, like, you know, if you're getting tired of animating or tired of writing, then you can switch to doing a different part of the process, like drawing a background or doing some music or whatever. Just getting away from it seems like the most reliable way to get around it 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 almost seems like the answer is like have a project with a big enough scope (laughs) that you can work on one part of the project and it feels like getting away from the other part of the project yeah i don't know if it applies to everything (laughs) um but that's that's what i usually do or just walk away and like you know accept that you're not going to work on it for a few days and just like go for walks watch some movies just you know do whatever other hobbies you have and then eventually when you feel like fresh enough you can come back to it nice i love that watch a movie on a walk <laughs> yeah maybe just not i don't know just be please give be yourself careful. give yourself the space i would say yeah like give yourself the freedom to not be productive and like accept that because you know yeah. when you're like just beating yourself up like oh, i should be getting stuff done why aren't i like that doesn't really help you kind of have to yeah go, like, okay maybe today i'm not getting anything done Maybe this week or this month, but then I'll, you know, hopefully I'll try again in a couple of weeks and it'll be okay. Yeah, that's great. Is there anything that you want to plug real, like, 
before we we leave oh uh patreon.com slash aaron long give aaron money yeah give me some money he's forgotten to monetize his videos <laughs> yeah please <laughs> that guy daft pino is really on my ass about that uh, a couple of weeks ago oh, yeah. a couple of months he's like no i've seen that you didn't uh click monetize on if you're leaving money on the table i'm like what like ten dollars maybe <laughs> He, he's he's just been looping your video over and over again for months trying to get you money and views and it just found out that it, it's all gone away but um yeah. yeah i would just say yeah check out my cartoons it doesn't even really matter if you go to the patreon but youtube no go on the patreon y'all give some money to aaron help him make more cartoons but really just look up sublo and tangy mustard and watch it and tell your friends to watch it if you like it i just want people to watch it yeah it'd be nice yeah. to make money but i just do it because i like it it's true uh because then they're alive if people see them it means they're real exactly yeah mm -hmm. and i make i make a living working in the industry anyway like if i could make a second living from indie stuff that'd be great but i don't really expect it <laughs> and speaking of taking a break from being productive it sounds like this is uh where the audience is going to take a break from listening to us whoa 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 <laughs> Whoa, what so I guess that is the end of this creative <laughs> block. Aaron, thanks for being our guest and sharing your story. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun talking to you guys. And thanks to our listeners, too. Follow us on social media at CRTV Block, where we ask for drawing work prep drawing for preps where we ask for drawing prompts and questions to ask our guests huge thanks to our editor clements for editing the podcast marco for helping us produce the show and abuka for creating the short clips that we've been putting out if you love our show you can support us on patreon um you'll get early access to interviews and access to our discord community another great way you can support the podcast is just to interact with us on social media uh and on youtube you can comment what? Like, hit that bell, follow. subscribe, the bell, all of it. If you don't know what to comment, just tell us what your favorite indie cartoon is in the comments. And you can click all of the links in the description of this episode to follow Aaron everywhere and uh, to see our other social media. I've been your host, V. And I was Sean. Keep being creative, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.